This broadcast of OPF Radio on March 18th of 2013 is about how to talk to a cop if you want to. Gary Hunt is the guest, and your host is Sleepy Salsa. And that was Ashley Alasize's A Dangerous Situation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to Outpost of Freedom Radio. Professional police first appeared in America almost a half century after the ratification of the Constitution. The framers had contemplated enforcement of the law as the duty of private citizens a few constables and sheriffs on the side who could be called upon when necessary. Modern policing would be regarded by the framers as abhorrent to the fundamental principles of republicanism, especially considering how the growth of militarized police has permanently expanded the centralized power of the state. Historically, patriots have been particularly concerned about the behavior of the government's foremost agents in the field. Thus, it would behoove everyone within the Patriot community to learn how to diplomatically interact with officers by following some rules of the road so as to retain what liberty we have left. Tonight, we will be discussing how to handle police interrogations and what you need to do in order to turn these involuntary encounters around in your favor. With that said, let us turn to our guest. Gary, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good evening, Sleepy. Good evening. Let's go ahead and get started then. Gary, what is the purpose of the police? Well, police has a history that goes back to the Greek times. And uh, for centuries, it was the administration of uh, civil government, municipal government. Uh, In the United States, uh, the government actually had police units, the park police, the mint police, and secret service, marshal service uh, early on. But the first city to have uh, police was uh, Philadelphia in 1751, later Richmond, Virginia in 1807, and uh, Boston in 1838. Uh, they were constables, though. They weren't the, the same image that we have today. They enforced the policy of the, the local community, the city or the town, uh, whatever body existed, uh, civil body existed. Uh, the concept uh, that we've talked about in the Committee of Safety episodes of Reeves, Fence Reeves, Hog Reeves, people that, uh, Road Reeves, people whose responsibility to make sure the roads were uh, in repair. People had to maintain the road in front of their house, uh, make sure their pigs didn't go out and cause damage, uh, make sure that fences were on the property lines, things like that. Those were actually police functions of the city, so they weren't quite the the concept that we have, but um, Philadelphia and, and well, the th- three cities I mentioned developed police forces, but generally they were ununiformed, and their job was availability, just like a constable, but they were called police instead of constables. Um, the growth of police in the uh, country, there were private police. The Pinkerton National Detective Agency, for example, was a private police force that was out for hire. Um, they were responsible for their actions if they did misdeeds. They, if they arrested the wrong person, they found themselves liable. Uh, this was all covered in our cops are uh, constitutional. Uh, currently, however, we have nearly one million law enforcement, sworn law enforcement officers in this country. And just to top that off, 
In 2005, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that police do not have a constitutional duty to protect a person from harm. There is no legal responsibility to protect you, so that protect and serve on the side of police cars is propaganda, to say the the least. Now, more recent history of police. uh, From 1968 to 1975, there was a television series on it. It was very popular, and it probably represented police in the light of how they acted at that time. It was called Adam-12. Ken McCord and... and, uh, Martin Milner were the two officers. They were friendly, uh, helpful, always going out of the way to help people. Saturday Evening Post, Norman Rockwell was an artist, and he, for years, drew the covers of Saturday Evening Post. And one of the famous ones is a cop sitting on a stool at a soda fountain uh, talking to a little boy and giving him an ice cream. The boy was lost, and the cop was there to help him. This is the police that I was raised with. I'm a little older. Anybody that's 46 years old has lived in a new environment. Actually, people that are 56 or younger, uh, probably since they were 10 years of age when the first SWAT teams came out, have never really been uh, lived in a society that had these nice, friendly cops that do things for you, that help you. They, they were there to help. They, were, they assisted you in almost anything. Um, they were like an information stand uh, at the airport. Uh, they were friendly people. They were nice. And uh, a lot of times, they'd, if a, a drunk wasn't too disorderly, they'd tell him to park his car, and they'd give him a ride home, and he'd have to go get his part of the car the next day. Over the years, though, it turned into revenue uh, agencies where they raised uh, Seminole County, Florida, $28 million in 1989, I believe it was. $28 million raised in traffic fines. Now, some other aspects of the history of law enforcement. During World War II, uh, the older officers stayed on longer. They went past their retirement because the all the young men were off fighting a war. Now, at the end of the war, the guys that were MPs in Europe or in Asia uh, came back, and, hey, they were suited to become cops. So we got a little shift in the mentality, but the attitude towards the public was still friendly. But these guys were a little more forceful because they were – um, dealing with uh, soldiers that were drunk and had their lives on the line every day, so there was a, a you know a little more violent opposition to their efforts, but that was nothing compared to what began happening in 1967. In 1967, Los Angeles Police Department opened the first SWAT school, and. Years ago, I had a copy of a portion of their manual, and it was rather interesting because the them, them or us mentality really grew from that uh, L.A. SWAT school manual. And basically it said, who are the bad guys? Well, it can be a disgruntled employee, an ex-convict. Uh, it went on and on and on, and, he, and then finally said, or even your neighbor. So these cops these were being trained to believe that even their neighbor, no matter how friendly he might be with a person, he might be a bad guy. So the line was created psychologically between the cops and the people beginning in 1967, 46 years ago. Um, That's the world we live in. That's the the other picture of the cop. This is the guy that uh, drives around in a car with air conditioning on. Back when I was a kid, air conditioning wasn't that pro- pro- uh, common, but cops always had their windows down. They were listening for yells of help or officer, I need assistance, or hey, can you tell me how to get here? But now they drive around with their windows up, uh, the air conditioning on, probably the radio on too, not the police radio, but the music radio and They've got their computer. They're in their little world in their car right now, and they're not aware of anything around them unless somebody gets breaks in on the radio and says, hey, go do something. Uh, their equipment nowadays has changed considerably. Back then, they used thirty eight caliber revolvers primarily. Now they have uh, uh, larger capacity magazines and uh, tend towards uh, 9 or 10 millimeter uh, projectiles. Um and the SWAT teams 
are military regalia. I mean, they've got body armor. Uh, they carry grenades, and often those grenades are mounted on a, a vest. Uh, they have full automatic weapons. They have, uh, uh, I think, the Lexan face plates that are uh, almost unbreakable. Uh, they've got Kevlar helmets. Uh, they wear combat boots instead of shoes like they used to. The only cops that used to wear boots were the motor, motor cops, the motorcycle cops. Uh, the world has changed, and <laughs> I guess one of the interesting things about police that comes to mind at uh, in Waco at a press conference, Lewis Beam was in there, and uh, he raised his hand and was called on by, uh, I think it was Ricks, and he said, uh, is what's happening here in Waco in- indicative of the coming police state? And he was ushered at gunpoint out of the room. So we got the answer, even though they didn't answer it verbally. So that's the evolution of, of cops. And now we live in a world where we, uh, every one of us, will from time to time have to deal with a cop. And um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, is there a difference between police and sheriffs? Well, there used to be a substantial difference between the two, uh, but the sheriffs tend to be adopting uh, a nearly uh, a police uh, SWAT tactic. Most sheriff's departments, larger ones at least, have developed their uh, SWAT tactics. We saw one in action in Tucson, Arizona, when Werner was killed. Um, they seem to, the, the sheriffs used to be respectable for the most part. They were a step above the local police. They were better paid, better educated, better trained. But there's a tendency now for them to emulate the police in pursuing this military uh, characteristic. And the lines of jurisdiction that used to exist, police could only work within the city limits, sheriffs only within the county. Uh, but by reciprocal agreements, now sheriffs can cross county lines. In fact, uh, in Ventura County, California, back in the 1990s, uh, a guy named Donald Scott was shot and killed in his home in Ventura County. And Ventura County Police Department didn't even, or Sheriff's Department, didn't even know that Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, the National Park Service, and a number of other federal and Los Angeles agencies were participating in a drug raid in Ventura County. So the jurisdictional lines that used to exist have, have just dissipated by reciprocal agreements. And Ventura never took action against uh, Los Angeles County for breaching that. So though there was a difference, and the sheriff is county, uh, and primarily in the old days, the sheriff's job was to arrest people that uh, had committed crimes, and that was about the extent of it, the the idea of preventing crimes, uh, even though I you know I did a little research before the, in the last few days before the show, I keep saying that their police's job is to prevent crime. It never has been to prevent crime. You can't prevent crime. You can only punish crime. If you prevent crime, it becomes preemptive, and that preemptive is the assumption that you might commit a crime. So we have evolved into where they really believe that they can prevent a crime, and, and I think the sheriffs have tended the same way. Uh, so at this point in time, I would say the distinction between sheriffs and police department has more to do with the uh, patch on their shoulder than anything else. If I heard you correctly, I believe you stated uh, a few moments before about, I think it was 1969, if I heard you right. 1967. Uh, 1967. So is that really the penultimate uh, year when there was a change in police behavior, or was it more incremental? I guess put another way, when precisely did the change in police behavior occur that you know of? Well, any change comes slowly, and I mentioned a couple uh, significant ones, the uh, the returning of the soldiers, the, the MPs uh, in particular from World War II, who then filled in the gap created by the uh, older officers who uh, had held off their retirement until there were some young younger men to replace them. So there was a little bit of a shift then, but it wasn't significant because the Martin Milner type cop was still on the beat. They were very friendly when I was a kid. Uh, uh, 
I was out after curfew. Los Angeles County had a curfew, or Los Angeles uh, had a curfew then, and a uh, cop took me down to the station and uh, called my parents. My mother t- came down, picked me up. We talked to the cop for a while, and they said that w- that was it. Now they put you in the can, they arrest you, and everything. If I don't know if they have curfews anymore or not, but uh, they would uh, nowadays they would definitely arrest you for that. I mean, they've arrested. Uh, little boys for uh, chewing pop tarts into the shape of a gun. Um, but the biggest change probably came beginning in 1967, where uh, the shift uh, from the friendly officer to the imposing uh, dictatorial uh, them rust mentality cop uh, was a direct byproduct of the SWAT team, special weapons and tactics units that were being created all over the country. (laughs) And even small towns have SWAT teams now as if they're going to have an event that warrants that. Uh, So since they have the SWAT teams, the SWAT teams, they can't just, you know, we're paying these guys, we've trained them, and we can't have them sitting around waiting for a big event. So tell you what, if we're going to serve an arrest warrant for parking violation, we might as well just use the SWAT team. If uh, a drug bust where the smoking pot, which generally doesn't, uh, except for dealers, include violence, handguns, and things like that, uh, they still use the SWAT teams. And the SWAT teams uh, traditionally do not knock. Um, in fact, I'll give you a, a good for instance. Uh, two friends of mine, Doug Carpa and, and Joe Valencourt, were... Uh, uh, February 26th, 1993, two days before Waco in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, this, the crime uh, was paper crime. They were charged, They neither one was convicted of it, but they were charged with uh, setting up f- phony trust. The trusts were legitimate. There was never a conviction. In fact, I don't think they even went to trial on it, but in both cases, the at, at Joe Valencourt's house, the front, uh, you, you let's see, describe it, the window to the living room face forward, and then there's a little alcove sticking out, and the front door then is uh, to the left of those windows, and you walk right in front of the windows to the front door. Well, they didn't go to the front door. They went in through the windows to his house. And this is to grab his computers and things because he was uh, suspected of uh, creating fraudulent trust. I'm not sure the specifics of Doug, Doug Carpus' event on the same day, but um, I, I know in talking with Doug that it was not a knock and, uh, oh, hello, who's there? Uh, oh, come on in. Uh, that uh, I think the door was pushed open, that it was, if I remember correctly, it was pushed open when it was open slightly to see who was there. Uh, so the mentality of using these SWAT teams has become uh, an everyday occurrence now. The The... <laughs> Service of warrant for just about anything. So nothing that, uh, in Joe and, and Doug's case, nothing that would be indicative of uh, uh, the potential for violence. But still, the SWAT teams are used to serve warrants because we got them and we might as well use them. But the change came in 57. The whole mentality, the pivot point from the friendly cop that was there to assist you and do what he could to. Uh, enforce the law, not prevent violations of the law. The only prevention of violation of the law would be stopping the commission of a crime in progress. If somebody was robbing a jewelry store, the cop might then do something, but it wasn't a presumption the jewelry store was going to be robbed unless somebody was standing there with a knife or a gun pointed at the uh, the owner's head and grabbing jewelry out of the trays. Uh, so 67 is the focus period. And like I say, most people 56 or younger really have never experienced the, the good cops. They have been conditioned their entire life towards these uh, the mentality we have now. What are the common forms of police-citizen encounters? Well, I think there's generally there's four types. The one most people will incur in their lifetime is a traffic or casual stop. Uh, we're all familiar with that. Light goes on, pull over, and papers, please, all that. Next one is a general sweep. Let's call it that. That's checks points, uh, crime scene stops, uh, drug area stops, 
disruption of an assembly, uh, would, what happened in Pittsburgh a few years ago during the, the conferences up there. Uh, border crossing uh, stops, uh, border patrol stops, these are becoming more common. Uh, but they're ones that they're a factor of uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're going down the road, and they set up a, a checkpoint. Whether you know there have been various court decisions on on what they can do there, but they seem to get around those court decisions all the time. But uh, again, those are rather casual. They're not directed. They're not specific. The third one is a warrant service, whether it's a knock or no knock service. Uh, and like I say, quite often those are no knock and there is a presumption that there's going to be violence regardless of the circumstances. Um, the services I've seen like divorce, please don't serve divorce papers anymore. Um, uh, process servers do private people. I've served divorce papers for friends before. And the fourth one is the investigative interview. That's where you by name have been picked out to be interrogated by law enforcement agencies either about something you might have done, but more likely about something that might have been done by somebody that you know. And, and uh, at Outpost of Freedom Radio in the archives, you'll find uh, Randy and the Feds, the first uh, program on Outpost of Freedom Radio, in which Randy uh, Mack was the object of one of these um, investigative interviews. So those are the four types of situations you run into generally with cops. They, they would come in those four categories. Should you treat every police encounter as an interrogation or as an arrest? Well, technically, if you're detained, it's an arrest. However, if the information they're seeking is pertinent and justified, for example, a traffic stop, uh, he will either give you a citation or not give you a citation and advise you to drive slower or get that taillight fixed or something like that. Um, you know, with service of a warrant, you're sim simply receiving a piece of paper if it's a service. If it's a search warrant, however... Um, it is really an arrest. You are detained. Uh, Dare Shout was told to sit in a chair in his living room while a, a SWAT officer, this is in Phoenix as well, SWAT officer held a shotgun on Dare for over two hours, not directly at him, but uh, uh, facing him holding a shotgun. Uh, potentially, any time you have an encounter with police, it can turn bad except perhaps the service of uh, paperwork, uh, notice to appear or something like that, divorce, if they do still do divorce things. Really, anything has the potential of exploding, and an amazingly large amount of discretion is left in the hands of the officer themselves. What should your attitude be during a questioning uh, should you be scared belligerent or relaxed I'll go with C relaxed um, we're all familiar with uh, dogs I'm sure and if a dog per perceives that you fear the dog the dog gets more aggressive towards you and is more likely to bite you um, the difference between dogs and cops is dogs don't wear uniforms the cop has the potential of nearly forcing an escalation into something that could get you arrested. One of my favorite charges is arrested for resisting arrest. Now the question is, what was the person getting arrested for when he resisted arrest? But I've known three people that have been charged and convicted of resisting arrest when there was no arrest in progress except the arrest for resisting arrest. And that was out of belligerence, and the courts upheld it. And they were fined $150 or something like that, and time served, which means the time they spent in jail prior to getting bailed out. 
Uh, so you have to treat everything with the understanding that it could escalate. And if you don't want it to escalate, the be- best thing you can do is be relaxed, calm, friendly. You don't have to be open. You can answer the questions um, to the extent that you're willing to. Don't try and hide anything and don't try and give anything up. You know, it's it's hard without having an example. If we want to play uh, uh, cop and questioner, I guess we could go into this. But basically, uh, the cop has the potential of throwing you in jail. So be nice to him. Um, Richard McDonald, he was probably the premier state citizen. I spent two uh, weeks with him back in 1992 uh, in California, uh, learning from him. Uh, and he has some interesting ideas on a traffic stop. He doesn't have tags on his car, but he does write the VIN number and put it in the back window. He doesn't drive with the driver's license. When he gets stopped, he gets out of the car. Nowadays, it's harder to get out of the car. They don't want you to get out of the car. And we'll get to that in a minute. But he gets out of the car and walks and stands back by the back of the car. And the cop walks up and says, uh, uh, I see you don't have any tags on your car. And he'll look down at where the tag should be, and he said, uh, you're right. Uh, do you have a driver's license? Do I need one? He's polite the whole time. He's very polite. He's not pissing the cop off. Uh, well, everybody needs a driver's license to drive. Well, I'm not driving. I'm <laughs> transporting my or I'm a I forgot his wording, but uh, he calls his car contrivance. It's a mechanical contrivance. It's not a an automobile. Didn't used to be a motor vehicle. A uh, motor vehicle in U.S. code is something used for commercial purposes. Uh, I think that banks are primarily, or lenders are primarily, behind the fact that everything's become a motor vehicle. I. Uh, know that I can go down and buy a truck, for example, and tell them I want the um, statement of origin, which is the birth certificate of the truck, and I don't have to go down and register it. But when you buy a car, you make it commercial because you sign this little package of power of attorney and all this other stuff so they can go down and get it registered uh, for you. Uh, the reason they do that, uh, and then you're issued a certificate of title, that t- certificate of title is an insurance paper, and it says that the, li- the, uh, the note holder, uh, the lien holder, owns the car, and he's letting you use it until you pay it off. And when that's finally resolved and you pay it off and get a release of lien and get the title the, uh, totally in your name, you... you don't bother removing it from that list of motor vehicles. But being a motor vehicle, being commercial, it's easier for them to attach the car. They're not stealing their car when they take it out of your garage for non-payment, which people assume that they are. They assume they own the car. So making it a motor vehicle served two purposes. It gave the government a a greater degree of control over that commercial enterprise, and it also made it easier for lenders to recover their property. Um, Getting off the point here a little bit, but uh, back to the attitude during questioning, be friendly. Um, don't say anything you don't want to say. Uh, be cordial. Uh, if he asks a question that has nothing to do with he's, what he's asking you about, uh, say, well, I don't see why that's relevant to why, uh, you know, what we're talking about here. And But do it politely. Don't get in his face. It doesn't work. The more pissed off you get him, like that dog, the more he pissed off he's going to get it. Uh, the more you piss him off, the more aggressive he is going to become to the point of arresting you. All right, and Gary, to follow up on that, what can be done to manage or otherwise handle your nerves during a police encounter? <laughs> Especially with that lump in the throat feeling. Drink a drink of beer. Uh, it is tough. I mean, the first time you, you deal with the cop uh, with an attitude that you don't like the son of a bitch, uh, it's really hard to cover that up. Uh, but you just have to relax and, and keep your composure. Uh, 
Uh, the, the, we just talked about the traffic stop. It, it, it's casual. You you have to stay casual. You just have to force yourself to. Somebody I know was telling me about an event they had the other day and telling me what they went through. And I think they did an admirable job in, in keeping their composure and uh, and dealing with the questions and even asking questions back. Uh, not pointedly, uh, not um, uh, belligerently or anything, but just asking questions. Uh, one instance, for example, when I went to Waco, Texas, we got in in the evening and Steve Roberts picked us up uh at the airport, Mike, another guy from Florida, and I and Steve were in his pickup truck. We went down by the checkpoints and turned off of the main road to go back towards where the checkpoint was. We saw five or six cop cars down there saying, oh, shit, we don't want to deal with this. It's about 10 o'clock at night. So we turned around and went back out on the the main road, uh, Loop uh, 2114 or something. I don't recall the name of it now. And all of a sudden, there's flashing lights behind us. And... Uh, so we got pulled over and we all got out of the truck and uh, Steve showed his ID. He was driving. Cop asked Mike for his ID. Mike showed it to him. Cop asked me for his my ID. And I said, uh, I don't think that I have to show you my ID. I wasn't doing anything that uh, justifies it. I'll tell you what my name is. So I'll be glad to volunteer that. My name is Gary Young. And he says, well, you have to show me your ID. And I said, look, um, I'm not from Texas, so I might be wrong, but my understanding is that uh, – uh, you don't have a right to ask for uh, any identification from me unless I've done something that uh, warrants your suspicion. And he says, well, there is a law in Texas that says you have to do that. I said, I'll tell you what, you tell me what the statute or the, the code is, and I'll show you my license. And so he rattled off some numbers, and I, uh, Steve wrote them down. And uh, so I showed him my license. Well, he was lying. Uh, we checked it out the other day, and it had nothing to do with showing identification. Uh, but it was casual. We were all polite and everything. And the other officer went over to the back of the pickup truck and started putting his hands on our suitcases, which were in the back of the truck. And I said, hey, keep your hands off of those. And he jumped back away from it. And that was the only loud or uh, any, anything. It, and it was still done without, you know, demanding voice, just get away from my stuff. Uh, so we, we created no friction in that. I questioned the guy. He lied to me. I showed him my ID. Uh, the other guy backed away from the back of the truck and didn't even look back in the bed again, anymore. That's the traffic stop. General sweeps, checkpoint stop, crime scene stop, drug area. Oh, oh let's go back to casual stop, too. There's, a, uh, there, there's some things that happen in, in traffic stops, and Florida is notorious for that. Uh, this because it's a drug corridor, but from what I understand, it occurs in almost every state. Now, when you're stopped, you... Uh, are being detained for a citation being written or just to be questioned and he passed you on, get the tail light fixed or slow down a little bit. Once he's done with you, you're free to go, but you don't want to go unless he gives you permission because he might shoot you and claim you were fleeing or something. So uh, when he's done and turns around with his ticket book, even if he says you're free to go, just say, you said I'm free to go. And uh, he says, yes, but the trick is that they use is uh, to do a search is to say, can I search after they've released you? They cannot do it while they've got you detained. So he'll start to walk away and he'll turn around, come back and say, can I search your vehicle? You can say Fifth Amendment. You can say anything you want. And more than likely, you will arouse his suspicion in doing that because he'll say, well, he didn't want me to search the truck. And for some reason, the courts have upsell, upheld his ability to do that. The only answer is not an answer. When he says, can I search your truck? You look at him and say, did you say I'm free to go? The only thing you say after he's released you, am I free to go? Am I free to go? If you have to say it a hundred times, don't say anything else. Do you have anything to hide? Am I free to go? Do you have drugs in the car? Am I free to go? The only thing you say, anything else arouses suspicion. As stupid as that sounds, if all you say and... Uh, let's see, we need to get to that too. All you say is, am I free to go? There's nothing else to be said. There's no other questions to answer. His questioning period was over when he turned away from you after the initial stop. Things that you should 
have with you at all times, and, and they're amazing nowadays. When I was in Waco, I had a micro cassette recorder, and sometimes my interviews were so long, I'd go through, uh, I got 45 minutes each side of a micro cassette. I'd go through five, ten micro cassettes in, a, in an interview. Uh, now I've got this little thing that costs half of what that does. All it needs is batteries, and it will 42 hours of conversation. It has various settings for crowds, meetings, um, and different things. And you can drop it in your shirt pocket and leave it on and record the entire conversation. And it could save your butt in court if the cop is willing to lie. Now, we all know that cops never lie. Uh, ask any judge. And he'll tell you that. Yeah, to follow so, up on... Oh, sorry. So anyway, that recording... Uh, you don't ever use unless the cop lies in court. If you end up going to court and the cop says, well, no, uh, he never said, am I free to go? And, uh, Your Honor, you know, uh, it may have been illegal for me to do this, but I just didn't trust the cop, so I want to play this for you. Am I free to go? 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 And uh, that makes the cop a liar, in his own words, because his words are on there as well. Uh, so having a little recorder like that with you at all times, driving around near the front door in your house if you expect them to come to your door. Uh, another guy I know was two or three times had people, cops come to his house in a northwestern state. And after the first one, I told him he needed to get a recorder. He never got the recorder, or he got it and didn't have it handy. If I go somewhere, my recorder is with me. It's just your driver's license and your recorder. So it's uh, that recorder can be your salvation in many situations. Um, well, you had a question? Yeah, just to follow up on that, though, I, I, I'm partially surprised when you're saying don't say anything else other than am, am I free to go because I remember seeing and perhaps this is uh, due to the effect of because YouTube said so I remember seeing different tutorials made by um, different activist organizations where they kind of role play with uh, police encounters in, in different scenarios like traffic stops and other things where one of the, one of the few types of things you are supposed to say if this is what they're claiming we are supposed to say if the cop does want to search your car is something along the lines of officer I don't consent to any searches. Are you saying that's not accurate or what exactly? Well, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, uh because but basically he's gotta walk away. And generally he'll say you're free to go to break that. He has to break that initial stop to justify a subsequent search. If he says you're free to go or he walks away and then turns around, I'm going to stick to, am I free to go? I, I suppose you could say I don't consent to a search, and then he'll ask. That That opens up a line of questioning. Let's play it right now. Um, uh, by the way, uh, Sleepy, can I search your car? Am I free to go? <laughs> well, I, do, do you have anything to hide in the car? Can I search your car? Am I free to go? I thought you were going to use the line you got from YouTube. Oh, okay. Let's do that one. Um, okay. Officer, I don't consent to any searches. Why don't you consent to a church or a search? Are you hiding something from me? Officer, I don't consent to any searches. Hmm. That's rather suspicious. Get out of the car. Hmm. That's what I could envision happening under that circumstance, so I would not do it. If I simply say, did you, did you say I'm free to go or am I free to go, I don't open the door. But once I respond to what he's querying about, I've begun to open a door, haven't I? Yes, yes. And, the, and, and just in terms of uh, source citations, the uh, organization that did advise doing that was known as Flex Your Rights. But interestingly enough, they also said the same thing you just said, which is the am I free to go thing. So it's interesting they said both. Um, well, the problem with flexing your rights is you're telling a cop who's supposed to know the law and is sworn to uphold it what the law is. Mm. And they don't like that. Point taken. Now, just to clarify, is there a difference between questioning and interrogation? 
Oh, questioning is probably broad, and interrogation is more specific, but um, what we just went through went from questioning to interrogation. Do you have something to hide from me? Um, however, normal interrogation is usually really only on the investigative interviews, the real context of uh, interrogation, and uh, we haven't got there yet. So general sweeps, checkpoints, stops, things like that. Answer the questions. Um, you know, I, there's a, I think he's a parson or something that likes to give the Border Patrol agents a, a, a hard time. And one of the stops that was on a YouTube that I watched of him was he was going into California. Now, California has had, for my entire lifetime, border inspection, agriculture inspection stations. I've been at agricultural inspection stations where carloads of Mexicans packed like a, a you know, seven families living in a, a, a two-bedroom apartment. They were packed full. And those, the, all they asked, do you have any fruits or vegetables? Because it is illegal to take fruits and vegetables and some plants into California for fear of disease. Now, Nowadays, they come in on airplanes and everything else, but they still maintain these agricultural inspection uh, stations on nearly every road into California. In fact, if you go around Lake Tahoe, you can hit it twice. Um, I, I've done that. I've never left California, and I hit two inspection stations. Uh, they have them on the back roads, but the back roads eventually hit a main road uh, Back way I go from Arizona to California quite often is through uh, Herb, California, and it eventually gets to where an intersection where a number of roads have, have come together where they have the inspection station. So uh, that's normal, and it's been determined legal for California to uh, try and keep out uh, insects or plant disease. And uh, so that parson thought he was doing a good thing uh, actually he was if you look at it in context uh creating a risk but actually it is the thing of the past too because airplanes fly in there and they don't ask you if you brought any fruit, fruit on the airplane because i've flown into california so in fact it seems to me i've gone on a bus and they didn't ask me and uh, i haven't gone into california on a train yet so it's kind of moot but they still have that in practice but uh the the you know the border uh Inspection stations, you can challenge them, and you'll be delayed 10 or 15 minutes, even if you don't go over into the pullover lane. If you answer his questions, you're going to go on through. So it's a matter of whether you want to inconvenience yourself or not. Be polite, be cordial, answer his questions. If you have to lie, lie well. Uh, but, you know, get through those checkpoints. Warrant, service, uh, if it's a search warrant, <laughs> and this is where you really need a recorder. Uh, if it's a search warrant, you want to see the warrant and the affidavit. You have every right to demand to see the warrant. David Kresh asked for the warrant. He got shot. You might too. But you have every right to ask for the warrant. And a warrant has to be upheld by an affidavit. That affidavit has to be first person, not third person, which it was in, in Waco. Third person. Uh, but you have a right to ask for it. And if you can prove that you asked for it and they said, we don't have it with us, then you got something at least to fight back with later on. But you're not going to fight back then because they'll come in gangbusters. The recorder's always nice to have for that reason. If it's a search warrant, affidavit. If it's an arrest warrant, uh, warrant and affidavit as, as well. Investigative interviews. Now, this is what you just asked, uh, interrogation. This is where they come to ask you questions. Now, I've been... I call it interviewed by the FBI, but it's interrogation because it's directed uh, and it's for a purpose. They're there for a, pers a purpose. The first time we had, uh, I'll admit, <laughs> I'm immune on this one, uh, fortunately. Uh, I'll admit that I lied to the FBI when we were hiding Peter Chernoff in Florida because they came and, do you know where Peter is? No, I don't know where he is. Actually, I didn't. He could have been in the living room or the bedroom of the house he was staying in, but uh, uh, I lied to the FBI quite frankly. And uh, when Peter did turn himself in, when he, uh, when he pled the agreement, he got uh, also an agreement that nobody be prosecuted for helping him, him in his flight. So uh, 
but I was cordial with the guy. In fact, we, we sat and talked about a number of things. The FBI is pretty, uh, most of the guys are fairly intelligent. You can have some nice conversations, but they'll try and take the conversations where they want them to go. And what you've got to do is listen to them very closely because if they're trying to go somewhere, you want to discern where they're going and make sure they don't take you there. And that's very important. Another time I was interviewed, I was working in Phoenix at the time, and they came to where I worked, and they, we went out in the nice hot sun, 108 degrees or something, uh, for the interview, and the IRS and the FBI were there, and they wouldn't get to the point on, on the interview uh, or the interrogation. Finally, I said, well, you know, what, what are you really here for? Well, the IRS wanted to know if I paid taxes, and I told them no. Um, the FBI, though, was questioning about something out of Waco. We'd gotten a hold of a list of all the federal agents in Waco, the motel they were staying in, the room number they were in, and how they were paying for their room. I sent that to a guy named Jim Bell up in Washington. I faxed it up to him while I was in Waco. He wrote a rather interesting article called um, Assassination Politics. Um he got arrested on other charges. He threw a stink bomb in an IRS office and was arrested for some some crime. And when they went through his stuff, they found the fax from me to him, uh, or the cover sheet where I had signed my name because the fax went out of Kinko's. But I, here, Jim, here's what we were talking about. And so they were investigating me where I got this. My answer, they, they said, where did you get this list? And my answer was, um, I was flight all the way through. My answer was, uh, I guess our uh, in ability to investigate is as good as yours, isn't it? And that was it. We had resources, and I don't need to say what they are, but we managed to get a hold of that stuff so we can get things like that. And they were kind of dumbfounded because I wouldn't go anywhere with them. Again, you divert the question away from what it is by whatever it means you you can, but they're always looking for something. When you listen, if you listen to Randy and the Feds, you'll Randy did a pretty good job of of diverting things, not answering their specific questions. Uh, he did answer some. Uh, none of them were harmful. I mean, they were safe to answer. You can answer some. You, you have to be very cautious, though, because they'll try and lead you down the path, as we did earlier in this discussion. When you said, uh, "I don't give my consent to search." Uh, you don't want to be responsive. You, if any response you give, you want to try and lead away from where they want to go. Just be extremely careful. If you have to, if you start getting in too deep, shut up. Don't say another thing. Just leave it alone. Give it up. Uh, just say, I, I have nothing more to say until I've got an attorney present. Because they will, if you're not careful, lead you down to a point where they'll make you appear guilty of something and give them probable cause, and they can do it, and it's kind of hard to explain how they can do it, but they start going, uh, say, for example, through a series of questions about what occur, uh, where were you last Thursday night when the liquor store was robbed? Uh, well, uh, um, Thursday night, I, I think I went to a movie, and you know, they can actually tr trip you into to, uh, creating suspicion for something that you never even knew occurred. So at, at, one, at a point where you start feeling that you don't have control of where things are going, the best thing you can do at that point is say, uh, I think I've said enough. Um, I don't know where you're going with this, so uh, I think I'm just going to ask for my right to have an attorney present for any more questions. We'll terminate the interview right now. That's it. And if they start to ask you any questions, just say, did you understand me that I want my attorney present? If he says, call your attorney, well, that's not very reasonable this time of day. Or if it is in the daytime, call an attorney. Um, the consequences can be pretty severe if you, if you don't deal with it right. Should you treat every police encounter as an interrogation, as an arrest? Potentially, yes. Uh, well, you know, you know, random traffic stop might not be so random. Um, 
I had a failure to appear in the article that ended up, I mean, in the uh, ticket that ended up being the source of an article, What If I'm Arrested, that's on my blog. Um, we thought it was a traffic stop. No, they had an arrest warrant for me. And I was arrested. You never really know. Uh, you have to treat it at face value. If it starts to shift, uh, again, uh, if it starts to, uh, to shift and appears to be directed, that's when you need to either be very careful how you answer, what you say, um, or ask that an attorney be uh, present. Now, as far as whether it's an arrest or not, that's a rather interesting word. Uh, technically, if you're detained, you're arrested. But to be detained to question for a short period of time has been deemed not to be an arrest. Um, so it always has the potential. You might get arrested for resisting arrest if you get the cop pissed off enough. So potentially... Uh, everything can turn into an interrogation by you saying the wrong thing, even if it was just casual to begin with. It can into it, uh, turn into an arrest if you piss the guy with the gun off. Mm, no. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, damn, food for thought. I mean, yeah, I mean, they are armed. You know, they are carrying, you know, pistols and uh at the very least, and I don't think they would hesitate to use it if they thought it was in their interest. Officer safety. Oh, goodness sakes. If I hear about officer me, safety let, one let me, more time. Let me, uh, I had a book, and I, I, I think I loaned it to somebody, but a guy that wrote it, uh, in La, I was in Las Vegas in uh, 93 or 94, and I uh, met a lot of nice people up there. Uh, guy had written a book, I don't remember the title, but he looked at a 10-year period and how many unarmed people were shot and killed by law enforcement officers either in Las Vegas City or Clark County or both. I'm not sure which. One guy was reaching for a cell phone. He was shot dead in the parking lot of a convenience store. All these stories, when they go to... Uh, and, and some of them were casual stops. The cop got... Oh, man, I remember one from Florida. back. Uh, this is back in the 70s. Uh, a guy was going towards Titusville, and the cop stopped him, says, do you have a driver's license? The guy stuck his hand into his coat. The cop shot him in the head. The guy had a suit and tie on, and he was reaching to get his wallet out of his coat pocket, and the cop shot him. So there's always risk when the guy's got guns, especially with the mentality that they've got. Uh, but in Las Vegas, every one of these that went to, uh, went to coroner's inquest and every one of them was ruled justifiable homicide, and I think there were nearly 100 in 10 years, or just a little less than one a month for 10 years. There'd be 140 for a month, and I think there was almost 100 of them. I don't remember. So, the a, a simple stop, uh, well, Michael Hill in... Uh, militia chaplain, when I investigated that, and that's the death of Michael Hill on my webpage, uh, if you read that, uh, I believe that Michael Hill died because it was just a couple months after uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, and there had uh, been a notice, I think, from the Department of Justice to all law enforcement officers regarding militia, they may be armed and dangerous. Use extreme caution. All the evidence, including how he was shot and everything, is discussed in that article. There's autopsy photographs to demonstrate the bullet trajectory that I'm talking about. Um, and, and the other things, the, the, how the bullet hit his pistol and everything. Did I think the cop overreacted? He was scared. There was another car behind Mike. It pulled over behind the cop after the cop pulled Mike over. Cop got nervous, shot and killed Michael Hill, and uh, the other people uh, drove away then uh, when the uh, shots were fired or just before the shots were fired. I don't recall right now, but it's in, in the report. This is almost 20 years ago. Um, so I might think Michael Hill died uh, in a traffic stop where the cop got nervous. So it can happen, especially at night. 
but it can happen in the daytime. The one in Florida was in the daytime. Some of these shootings in Las Vegas that I mentioned were in the daytime. There's no telling what can happen when you have an encounter with a cop, and he has the gun and the right to use it. He has a license to kill. The interesting thing about a cop, if I'm out of vacation time, and I'm invited by from, from friends to go up to Big Bear Lake and enjoy myself, if I go kill somebody, I will be suspended with pay pending investigation. So cops can get a free vacation by killing somebody or even shooting somebody. But killing somebody, they will get a free paid vacation. Kind of a neat trick. Don't you wish you could do that with your job? Hey, if I go kill somebody, can I have time off with pay? Yeah, talk about, talk about the perversion of incentives. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's, you know, if something's offered in your employment, look at sick time. How many people abuse sick time? Too many. Well, if I get time off with pay for an investigation, I can abuse that as easily as I can abuse sick time. Can't I? It's there. I don't want to give it up. It's something to think about. There's a couple of articles that are probably worth consideration. One is called Popping Cops. And the other one is called When Should You Shoot a Cop? When should you? Uh, I wrote Popping Cops. Actually, it's an interview with a friend of mine named John. Uh, when Should You Shoot a Cop? A very well thought out piece by Larkin Rose. But after the encounter is over, you know, it's important too. Um, the older you get, the worse you get at this. Uh, write down everything that happened as best you, as you can determine. Now, if you go to court and the judge asks you questions and you read off of your notes, he said, why are you reading off your notes? I don't want to make a mistake in what I'm saying. He won't ask you any more questions. You have proven your diligence in recording the events that occurred during that stop. It's better to put it on paper, but you can also record it. Read it into the recorder. You know, I was just stopped about uh, 10.30 by these cops. Uh, the, and if you, it's on the same recorder, uh, what, what uh, is on this recorder was uh, the discussion during that stop. And uh, I just want to point out that I was not speaking. Whatever you want to add to that, but everything that you can remember. If the cop was belligerent, make it a point. You know, he was belligerent when he said... I want to search your car. Uh, so everything, all the details. Get them while they're fresh in your mind. Now, what should you do after the encounter is over? Oh, I, I guess I got ahead of you on that. I, what I just said is record. Uh, uh, preferably write it. Um, I have a bad habit. Um, in Seminole County, Florida, I've probably got 10 or 12 affidavits filed there. Uh, I got stopped for a DUI once. They took my gun and impounded my car. And uh, No, wait. They took the gun on a different one. Uh, they impounded my car once. I wrote everything out when I got out, bailed out the next day. Uh, I wasn't drunk. I was, well, maybe I was. What the fuck? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but I wrote down everything. Now, another time I was on my motorcycle. I didn't have tags on the motorcycle, and I didn't have a license. This is good old Roger McDonald stuff. First cop rolls on the scene, and we're talking and uh, about tags and everything. I never got a ticket for not having – oh, yes, I did. That's the one I went to court on later. But uh, I, I said that uh, tool pouch has a pistol in it, a 9 millimeter. And he says, can I see it? And I said, no, it's strapped shut and florida has a law that it, it i can carry a gun in a vehicle if it's two motions well unstrapping that and opening it and then pulling it out of the holster would be three motions really and on a motorcycle when you're riding i can't reach the tool pouch it's on the back of the sissy bar so he had no problems with it but then this other cop rolls on the scene and uh no, I guess I had the three fifty seven in there because that's right because I had to get it out of uh, get it back out from them. Um, 
second cop rolls on the scene, and the guy, first cop says he's got a gun in there. It's it says it's in a holster, strapped holster. Uh, the tool tool pouch is strapped shut, and see, yeah, I don't see any problem. And the second cop, this is how bad cops are. Well, I feel threatened. I want to see that gun. I said, you can't. We went back and forth, and finally he did it. Now, he had a gun, so I wasn't going to argue with him. But he opened it up. He took the gun. He imp- he impounded it. I had to go pick it up at the sheriff's department later on. But afterwards, I wrote the events of that account, and I went down and filed an affidavit in the public records. And when you do, when you do, if you write what happened and go file it in the public records, the interesting thing is... Judicially, an affidavit, sworn affidavit, is prima facie evidence. So if I go to, if I went to court on that, over the gun, or if you had a stop and and you want your evidence to to have more merit than just you saying it, if you record it in the public records and get a certified copy of that, and then you take that with you to court and say, I want to enter this in evidence. This is a sworn affidavit in the public records, certified copy. Uh, and this is prima facie evidence of the occurrence at the traffic stop. The only thing the cops put in writing is he was speeding or he had a broken tail light. That's all he's got in writing. You've got this record of the event, the discussion, what you recall, the discussion and everything. You have become Coca-Cola and he's Pepsi. Now, prima facie means stands before all else unless proven wrong, basically. So you can create prima facie evidence. So I've got all these things recorded in uh, Florida back in the 80s and early 90s, uh, anytime I had an incident, it got recorded. When I got uh, arrested on that warrant, uh, my wife and I both filed uh, affidavits as to the stop and what they said, what they did, and all this other stuff. So um, the best thing really is to fill it out, make it in the form of an affidavit, go down and enter it in the public records, style it affidavit, and they have to take an affidavit in public records, uh, file it, and ask for a certified copy. And they might charge you two or three bucks for the first certified chop, uh, pro, uh, copy. They might charge a buck or two a page for the, uh, the filing. Uh, but that, now, if you go to court, you've just... The judge can't refute that. There's record, uh, record evidence sworn to by you in writing, written shortly after the event, date and time when you wrote the affidavit and everything, that uh, a lot of times you can beat the cops on that. I've not, I didn't use that when I fought that, uh, that motorcycle stop. That was a habeas corpus that I used that time. But I filed the affidavit with the intention of using it until I decided that I wanted to try the habeas corpus. But keep a record of what happened. That's very important. All right. And uh, before we go to break, just want to ask one more question. How can you avoid encounters with the police? Stay at home. Stick your head in a hole in the ground. Uh, <laughs> it's impossible to avoid encounters with police. Now, we went over the four types of encounters, driving down the wrong road at the wrong time. You get caught up in a some type of brake test, no matter what they call it. It's a stop. You exceed the speed limit. Um, it's almost impossible to avoid an encounter with the stop, uh, with cops. Uh, I'd venture to say that unless you're a politician or somebody high in government that you have had an encounter with cops of one form or another during your lifetime. And, uh, well, I guess Ted Kennedy got by without an encounter that one time in Chappaquiddick, but uh, you you can't avoid them. Uh, There's no way. The, the, The preparation is what's necessary. Understand what you're going to do if you ever get caught in that situation. That's what's important. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to go to break. Lie back, sit back, grab a cup of coffee, uh, do what you need to do, and we will return momentarily. And we will take some questions. It takes a lot of effort to make it successful. It is truly a labor of love to bring high quality episodes of OPF Radio to your digital music player. However, we do need to meet our operating expenses. 
We are completely independent media who are entirely supported by our listeners. So we are not beholden to either corporate special interests or unscrupulous advertisers who would use us to push their products. If you believe in our mission to bring original and useful material to the Patriot community, please consider making a donation today. Thank you so much for making this outreach effort worthwhile for all of us. And that was Fight for Your Rights by Pokerface. Please support them at pokerface.com. They are a good Patriot rock band that have been operational since the 90s. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this broadcast of Outposts of Freedom Radio. Tonight we are discussing how to talk to a cop if you want to. We are taking calls and your questions at this time. The call-in number is area code 530-576-5790. Again, that's area code 
five seven six five seven nine zero. Alternatively, you can add user OPF radio if you happen to have Skype, or you can simply type your question into the listener chat room, and I will read them for you on the air as your voice. Now, while we wait for those lovely questions, comments, and so forth from the audience, Gary, before the break, you mentioned placing an audio recorder in your uh, shirt pocket. Would you uh, would you recommend that everybody everyone carry some sort of audio visual equipment on them as part of their everyday carry? For less than forty dollars plus batteries, in fact, some come with batteries included. Most of them nowadays. I would say that is probably the best protection you can have. Remember, cops never lie unless you can prove that they lied. And that's that's the judicial system. Cops never lie. But if you can prove that they lied, that's the exception. The only time that they lie is when you can prove that they did lie. So, yes, carrying that with you all the time. You know, you probably ought to have one in the console or, you know, conveniently located in your car. If you get pulled over on a traffic to- stop, make sure the batteries are charged. You know, every, every couple of weeks, check your oil and your batteries in your recorder. Uh, put it in a convenient location. You get a stop. Turn it on. Put it in your pocket. Uh, put it on the dashboard. Uh, but, yes, that is probably the best protection that you can have. Unless you really screw up badly. Hmm. Okay, actually, we, uh, let's see. Even Hand from the chat room asks, seeing that picture at the top of this page, he's referring to the OPF radio page, it would be easy to make the assumption it is the drug war that has fostered the militarized alphabet soups. However, did this type of police behavior occur during prohibition well for those that don't see the picture for any reason we don't have it on Spraker and won't have it at other locations there's a picture with martin milner and ken mccord from adam 12 smiling friendly cheerful cops shiny uh, uh hats uh badges showing on the left side and on the right side and it says the caption is when did this become this and the right side become this is guys with uh, fully automatic rifles for per- personal defense. Uh, no, you can't do that for personal defense. It must be for aggression. They have uh, face masks on. They're, I don't know why they're ashamed, because I can see every bit of McCord and, and Milner's face. Uh, they, I see their eyes and the bridge of their nose, and that's all I can see. on the. I can't even see their mouth. I don't know if they have teeth. Uh, in the, the other picture, they've got black gear, black, well, Milner and McCord have black on, but they've got a vest on it, uh, minimally, at least a, a flak vest, if not uh, a Kevlar. They've got a Kevlar helmet, and they've got the uh, Lexan uh, uh, goggles. They're up on their helmet right now. Uh, they have heavy gloves on. The gloves say SWAT on them. The shirt says Sheriff, or the vest. Uh, these guys are, you know, if they were green, they'd be military, but they're not. They're black, and black is always evil, isn't it? Uh, it has become such. Now, as far as the, uh, the, 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 so that's the picture that it was referred to. Now, as far as the question, 1967, the drug problem wasn't that great in this country. Uh, it was beginning to come that way, uh, work that way. Did they have it during Prohibition? No. Uh, most of the cops in Prohibition uh, that busted the stills were in civilian clothes. They were actually the uh, was it the FBI or Division of Treasury. I don't recall which which uh, outfit it was, but they were mostly civilian clothes. They might have assistance of cops to take away those that were grabbed then. But if the cops were there, they had uniforms on and they had their thirty eight caliber revolver. Um, no, the. the there were no SWAT teams during Prohibition, even though it was worse because the proliferation of Tommy guns in this country at that time was uh, unbelievable. There were tens of thousands of Tommy guns in circulation at the time, and the bad guys had the Tommy guns. Now, some sheriffs did, too. Uh, the ones that shot uh, uh, Bonnie and Clyde had a Tommy gun. 
but most often the cop on the street had a uh, 38 caliber revolver, six shooter, uh, five, uh, six or seven, depending on the style he had then. And uh, they were relatively small. They weren't even 357s. So no, that, that and, and it wasn't the drug war that necessarily brought this on. In 1967, drug was not a big problem. One of the first big events with the SWAT team was the Symbionese Liberation Army. Uh, I think there was another event and I don't uh, know that I've got a made note of that. There was another event. Actually, the first SWAT team was not in L.A. The first SWAT team school was in L.A., uh, but the first SWAT team was in a San Bernardino County at a little town, and I'm not sure why they created that thing, but uh, it was kind of set the groundwork. It probably wasn't nearly as sophisticated as what L.A. set up, and as we know now, they've become even more sophisticated. They've got uh, armored vehicles, uh, puncture-proof tires. Uh, there's some a picture of one that was in Aguila, Arizona, just, just a little while back that has a pivoting shield with a gun slot in it uh, on the roof so a guy can have a you know metal between him and the, the perp and stick his gun through the slot and shoot the guy. Uh, it's just become unbelievable. These are not law enforcement people. These are murderers just waiting for an excuse to pull the trigger. I mean, that in my mind, that's what I see in these guys. And uh, Guerna in Tucson saw that. A number of other people uh, have seen that. They've been shot to death. From Donald Scott, these guys weren't SWAT. They were just dressed officers, but... Uh, The evolution began in 67 to this military force. And think about that. There's almost a million law enforcement officers in this country. There's a little over 300 million people in this country. The average family is 3.2 people. That means we have a law enforcement officer for every 100 families, roughly. Now, that's a police state. Are mutual aid phone call trees effective for police encounters? Uh, <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, the Patriot community has set up these mutual protection packs, and uh, so you'd have to ask who to read militia or. Uh, Oh, what's his name? Richard McLaren from Republic of Texas or some of the other people who have been abandoned by those that said they'd be there. But, you know, if you can expect, I'll tell you, the security team that we did a story, a uh, radio program on a security team here on OPF Radio, and you can find it in the archives. A security, our security team would have been responsive to something like that, and we did have everybody's phone number. This is before cell phones. I had a mobile phone. I was the only one, but I, it was part of my business. Um, but with cell phones nowadays, you are in instant communication. Now, the security team, these we were all committed to each other, and so if something happened, if the need arose, as it did on a couple of occasions, not in a traffic stop or an interrogation, but when a need arose, everybody responded without question. If, if you had a group of people that tight together, uh, but I would say it would have to be a small group. If you've got 100 people, you might have two or three traffic stops a week. You're going to leave your dinner cold on the table while you go uh, respond to a, a, a simple traffic stop. There's no reason for anyone else to be there. Now, I got thinking, you know, we discussed that once before, Sleepy, and I got thinking about, though, and... Uh, if we get, can get those two links, popping cops and when you should shoot a cop again, something occurred to me that would be interesting, though, if you had a tight-knit group, that if you had a traffic stop, you're st sitting there talking to the officer, he's standing next to your car, and all of a sudden from his right side or maybe forehead, uh, he gets a bullet in his head from somebody that was notified on your list, and he falls down. Now, you got to make sure that he was facing the other way when he received the shot and he turned when he fell. And then they'll be looking on the other side of the road. But that's the only, this is in line with what Larkin Rose says. Um, 
that's the only time I could think that having assistance would be there. Now, the security team was in place when I got my tickets. Would I have called them? Is it going to do any good? Is there going to be anything served by it except taking them away from what they're doing? So I, I see no good reason at all to uh, even consider the necessity of having a, a, a calling train. Now, if you're getting raided, uh, the, the Browns up in where New Hampshire or somewhere up in New England, one of the New England states were holed up for a while, and all these people said they were going to go up there and they were going to keep the government from coming in. Uh, all the bravado and all that, the government came in, didn't do any good. Um, how committed are people? When are they ready to pull a trigger? Are they there to observe? Observing doesn't help. Uh, people for 20, 30 years have been saying, let's get everybody down to the courthouse. I'm on trial today. That ain't going to change the judge's mind or the prosecution's mind. You're going to get convicted or not based on the merit presented before the court or the jury. If anything, I could see in a jury trial that if they saw all these people coming in uh, and they started creating a bit of a problem, it could piss the jury off. It could piss, piss the judge off and he'd get a little harder on you. The only time I would think that you would need a backup force was when when there was either an anticipation of or expectation of initiating violence. Otherwise, now, it serves no useful purpose. Now, it's interesting you should mention that because, you know, there was that uh, Behind Enemy Lines episode we did about the line in the sand, and and people can go uh, listen to that for the uh, <clears throat> the Link Man. And uh, and it's fascinating you mentioned about whether, you know, you know whether the Patriots are ready to, uh, you know, defend Long themselves. Yeah, basically. Um, and so I think they would should really listen to uh, Line in the Sand uh, for more information about that. Um, okay, Matt from the chat room asks, in the situation that I've seen on YouTube where the guy in Oregon is open carrying and the cop responds to a call, in this situation, what right do the police have to detain you or otherwise ask for your CHL or driver's license or some such thing, you know, well, papers. <laughs> papers, please. Um, that gets into a rather complex legal situation that I, you know, we really don't have time for, and that's not the purpose of this show. I will say something rather general. Uh, we have rights. We know we have rights. Uh, my biggest fear all along is uh, me knowing I have a right to have a gun and a got cop thinking that I don't have a right. Does it become confrontational? Cops busted into my office to arrest me for failure to appear once. It wasn't an interrogation. It wasn't an interview. It was an arrest. They broke the front door in on my office. They came in. There was a 9 millimeter pistol resting about 6 inches from my hand. There was a uh, chambered round in it. Uh, there was an AK-47 with a 30-round magazine uh, to my left, less than two feet away. Uh, they had their guns drawn. Now, what do you do? Uh, I knew why they were there. And is it worth the risk? However, we have to consider our rights, too. At what point do we defend those rights? We know we can't expect the cops to defend their rights or even protect us. They don't serve and protect anymore. They abuse. That's all they do. They ought to be required by law to remove those stickers from their cars because Milner and McCord are gone. They, they don't exist. They may in some small town somewhere. There might be some sheriffs that are decent somewhere. But defending your rights. Um, there's a couple of classic... This will get a little bit legal. Um, when I was in Waco, Section 935C, I think, of the Texas Penal Code says if a law enforcement officer serving a warrant uses more force than it is necessary, the uh, person being served can use as much or more force, even to the point of shooting the officer. Uh, an 1899 or 1900 Supreme Court decision by John Bad versus United States 
uh, an officer was going to make an illegal arrest of John Bad Elk. John Bad Elk shot and killed the officer before the officer raised his gun um, and was convicted in the state court. The Supreme Court uh, remanded it, uh, said that it was a misdemeanor or no crime at all. We have a right to defend our rights. Whether the government recognizes that right to defend our rights or not is inconsequential. What matters is, are we willing to defend our rights? And in what circumstances will we resort to whatever force necessary to protect and defend our own rights? Now, the consequences afterwards is once you protect your rights... I doubt that justice can prevail in this country. The only thing that can protect you is getting out of Dodge and, and, and going underground. Uh, at what point do you do it? Uh, but go back to the guy uh, in the YouTube video. Would it have helped him to have 20 or 30 people saying, he's got a right to have that pistol? That's going to scare the cop. That's going to increase the potential of violence and i think that's what happened with mike hill that mike uh, the the cop had mike hill in front of him and three guys in a car behind him at night and he got nervous and mike hill died i believe that's what happened and if you go to that story and read it and try and put the pieces together as best you could which is what i've tried to do uh you can create problems by creating the appearance of a threat to a law enforcement officer. So unless you're ready to go all the way. Now, rock and roll was the term from Vietnam. And it meant, okay, we're ready to go out and kill some gooks or get killed, but we're ready to go. And that's it. When you, If you're ready to rock and roll, uh, that's it. You rock and roll. And it doesn't mean dance by a long shot. So... You have to weigh the circumstances, where we are politically at any given time and everything else. Now, to me, I thought the time to rock and roll was coming right after Waco. I honestly did. I've been waiting over 20 years now. No, it's just about almost exactly 20 years ago. Come April 19th, that's when I declared war against the United States government, and it's still a Cold War, and I didn't expect that Cold War to go on for 20 years. But when we're committed and really serious about what we're doing, we will start protecting our rights, whether it be from an illegal search, a search without a warrant. And that's exactly what John Bad Elk would, had. There was no warrant. There was no right to arrest John Bad Elk. He shot and killed John Killsback. They were both Indians. But John Bad Elk protected his rights by the officer, which is exactly what Texas statutes say, which the Davidians did. Excessive force. These guys jump out of a cattle van with this kind of armor and, and uh, uh, uniform that we've been t and, and weapons that we've been talking about. They jumped out of a cattle van to serve an arrest and a search warrant. By Texas law, everything, and that law has been on the books probably through most of Texas' history. The Texas founders, that, uh, the framers that wrote that law realized that law enforcement can be abusive and wrote that law for people to have the right to protect themselves from excessive force. Have we given up that right to protect ourselves against excessive force by government? All right, and for uh, purposes of citation, especially for those listening later on the podcast version, uh, what we're referring to with uh, the, the Texas uh, statutes is located in the Texas Penal Code, Texas Penal Code, subsection 9.31, comma, uh, C, subsection 9.31, uh, paragraph, uh, you know, C, and also for purposes of citation, especially for you guys listening Why later. Why don't you read it, Sleepy, so people let... Sure, sure, okay. Read the, it's, uh, read the uh, nine. It's very, it's very brief. It says, quote, 
the use of force to resist arrest or search is justified, one, if before the actor offers any resistance, the peace officer or person acting at his discretion uses or attempts to use greater force than necessary to make the arrest, and, number two, when and to the degree the actor reasonably believes that force is immediately necessary to protect himself against the peace officers or other persons, use or attempted use of greater force than necessary. And again, that's Texas Penal Code subsec subsection 9.31C. Also, now imagine yourself at Mount Carmel Center, and these come out of the, the the cattle wagon with these arms. The threat of force is there, without a doubt. So Texas law justified what the Davidians did when they did fight back. Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. And also, for purposes of citation, especially for you guys listening later on the podcast version, uh, we, we're relating to Matt's question about the fellow who open carried recently. I believe there was also a very – it was either the same or a similar incident. It's up on YouTube. The title is Detained for Open Carry, Portland, Maine, 26 May 2012. Again, that, the short version is Detained for Open Carry by uh, Boy, username Boy Scout 399 um, The video description, very briefly, I'm not going to read the whole thing. One sentence of it reads – he, referring to the Portland PD officer, admits his sole reason for stopping me is my legally carried firearm in violation of U.S. versus uh, DeBerry, and then he goes on. So obviously, if you go up YouTube, look for detained for open carry, those search terms, you should find it. And uh, usually, uh, we here at OPF Radio do not recommend uh, YouTube videos because of the phenomena, because YouTube said so, but this particular one does not is, is usually raw footage, so usually raw footage of... Police encounters usually tends to be pretty good, uh, which is preferable to, you know, edited footage where things look kind of skewed. All right. Now, Gary, this is rather interesting. Should Patriots role play police encounters? It, it probably doesn't hurt as long as the person that's doing the interviewing or interrogating is astute enough to try and get some trick questions in it. When I was stationed in Germany back in 65 or 66, the second in my battalion, our Sergeant Major was Sergeant Major, Major Okanagan. I still have trouble with it. Okanagan. He was Latvian. He was an interrogator for the U.S. Army during World War II. He interrogated your, uh, he, he was very versed in language, uh, but he interrogated Eastern European uh, prisoners, Germans, uh, uh, Poles that had, uh, had taken the German side, Czechs that had taken the German side, uh, an interrogator. And we used to sit down and have a beer with him every once in a while. And he'd sit there and it'd be a casual conversation. And when he, somewhere along the line, he'd, just say, he'd start telling you something about yourself that you didn't know you told him. A good interrogator listens very closely to what's said and puts pieces together and can uh, come up with things. And so the person that's doing the interrogating has got to, like that role-playing we did uh, a while back, uh, keep trying to get in. You can't just ask a question, get the answer, and then go on to the next question. You've got to be astute enough to try and sneak around the guy and get him to say something he shouldn't say. It, it probably wouldn't hurt. Uh, if you didn't have a good interrogator, though, it might hurt because you might develop a degree of self-confidence that's unjustified. So it, it depends on who is, is going to be doing the investigative role-playing more than anything. Mm, food for thought, then. Okay, well, Ethan Hand from the chat room again asks... There is new technology being used to track the Afghan population to find and identify the Taliban, namely a visor that takes a snapshot of your irises and identifies 
them from a database. How should we, okay, this looks like a two-part question. First part, how should we address that in the future because you just know they are going to sooner or later implement it here? And the second part is, heck, they can even get a warrant. Oh, just one question then, okay. Heck, they can even get a warrant and draw your blood currently. So how should we address well, that in the future? Well, one thing, they ain't going to draw my blood. Uh, they're going to have a problem when they try and do that. I, I'm willing to let them take my picture. And when I'm, when I'm fingerprinted, I uh, notify the officer I am not doing this voluntarily. He said, you'd better cooperate. I'm going to break I don't want to break your arm. And I say, look, I'm not going to resist. I am telling you I'm not doing it voluntarily. I want you to record that, okay? And then I just leave my arm limp, and he's got to pick it up and do the, do the shit. Uh, resistance, uh, when you're f physically disadvantaged, like in the police station, is futile. Uh, if you're going to resist, it needs to be outside of the police station. Once you get in the Sally Port, it's a done deal. You ain't going nowhere else. Um, as far as the, the visors, I guess, uh, I haven't seen very many Taliban wearing shades, but I think I'd wear shades if I was concerned about it. I don't think that they could uh, get that eye print. Uh, if you had shades on. Now, that brings up another interesting subject that I've looked into uh, called uh, facial recognition uh, software, which is pretty accurate. Uh, it's not, it's mathematical. It takes the distance between your eyeballs, uh, the, the, uh, how high above that line between your eyeballs the bridge of your nose is and the tip of your nose is below it, where your mouth is, how wide your mouth is, where your ears are. These are all mathematical equations that, surprisingly are not kind of like fingerprints not that necessarily that common um, they're interestingly since it's relying on darkness and light more than anything uh, and it is mathematical if you had a uh, uh, John boy what's his name the actor John boy John Wayne yeah. you mean no or John boy uh, the the Waltons Oh, I'm. I that was a little bit. He's got that big mole on his cheek. That would probably screw him up. If you took a an eye a, a eyebrow pencil and, and put a, a dark spot on your cheek, like a you know beauty mark that women used to wear, something like that. Uh, if you took some mascara and and changed the light and dark of where the bridge of your nose was, brought it down lower or up higher, things like that throw char uh, facial character recognition off. Now. I'm not sure if this one is true, but they say that the uh, facial character rec recognition software, if you tilt your head more than 15 degrees, it can't read you as a face. But you've seen it. If you've got a new camera, it picks the characteristics of a face. And it's using the same technology, though not as sophisticated as this uh, facial identification software. Uh, Richard Thomas, that's who it is. He's got that big mole on his cheek, and I don't know if that would screw up the, the fa facial recognition software or not, but you can distort it by shading your face. Perhaps tilting 15 degrees will do it. Uh, I suppose they could overcome that if they could somehow get that axis of the recognition software to change, but apparently at this point they haven't done that. Um, wearing something that, that covers your eyebrows. Uh, comes down over your eyes, bangs on a, a girl can really blow up the the, the recognition software. Um, so, so there are ways of beating these things. There's always if you're dealing with something uh, mechan mechanical or uh, technological like that, there's ways of beating it because it cannot evaluate beyond the characteristics that are programmed into that. And in that case. Uh, as in the eye uh, iris is kind of like the fingerprint. There's a pattern uh, on the edges of your iris. Uh, there tend to, if there are blood uh, lines, they tend to stay. They're they're fairly permanent. But the the circular part is the I think the the most identifiable one is kind of like it's got little jags around the edge, and that pattern of jags is, is in essence the fingerprint. Uh, so all you have to do is. Not let your eyes be seen. You know, if you uh, wear shades, they can't be seen. That's it. This country is common to wear shades. I see people wearing shades in dark rooms. I don't know why, but uh, so 
understanding what they've got, there are things that can address that. They cannot discern. They cannot say, well, they've got bangs on, so let's ignore those upper parts and just measure the lower parts, and we won't get a positive match, but maybe we'll get a partial match. And I don't think they do that. They're looking for a positive match. They don't recognize the face or they do. Uh, they don't recognize the eyes or they do. If there's no eyes to recognize, they don't. So uh, you just have to, and I'm sure you can find online. I found that information on the facial recognition software online. And I read uh, seven or eight different articles. And basically they're saying uh, the same thing. Only a few talked about the 15 degrees, but all of them talked about uh, and apparently this is the the logarithms they're using are based on measurements to certain points that are defined by darkness and light. So basically it's black and white imagery. They're looking for light spots and dark spots to measure to, to and from. Right. And uh, if people want more uh, uh, further details about how to do things like that, uh, I wrote uh, two book reports on my blog, one was on Edmund Mac Ignaz disguise techniques, fool all of the people some of the time, and the other one was John Sample's methods of disguise, and they're both in the chat room for the people who are listening live right now. And so if you want more details about how to explore that particular subject area, which really ventures more into more the, the privacy and a little bit uh, more of the informational security aspects, I would encourage you all to... Uh, to explore those. All right. Um, uh, the 6610 must be an old guy. He's talking about the weather underground. Well, that was back in the 60s. Sure. Let's let's get to that one next. In fact, actually, um, just for a moment, I just want to remind everybody that we are taking uh, questions at this time. The call in number is area code five three zero five seven six. Five seven nine zero again. Area code five three zero five seven six five seven nine zero. Alternatively, you can add user OPF Radio if you happen to have Skype, or you can simply type your question into the listener chat room, and I will read them for you on the air. And uh, let's let's take that next one. And I mean, good goodness sakes, Gary, we've got tons of listener questions. Well, I mean, we'll we'll keep going as long as we we are able to. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm glad the uh, listenership is definitely intrigued uh, by the uh, t- topic of tonight's broadcast. All right, let's let's take that uh, next one. Anon six six one zero from the chat room asks: Could actions like those of the 1970s weather underground happen again? Could those be effective? Ah, let's see. Uh, Weather Underground, interesting group. I met a number of them back in the 60s. I was a Vietnam veteran, uh, volunteered for Vietnam. When I got back, I didn't like Vietnam. I realized what was really happening over there, so I became active in the anti-war movement and as such met some of the people in Weather Underground. And it was there. what is the Weather Underground? Well, you don't uh, need a weather vane to know which way the wind is blowing was their slogan. And that was true. You know, the government was uh, oppressing people. Uh, we talk about um, demonstrations today. The demonstrations of the 60s were bloody. The The objective of ending the war in Vietnam uh, had a, 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 an infinitely higher degree of commitment than stopping NDAA or anything like that. Um, and the Weather Underground, uh, they were socialists, but uh, they were active. They robbed banks to fund their operations. Uh, in fact, some of the uh, SWAT operations were against the, the uh, Weather Underground at the time. Uh, they did some pretty harsh stuff. Now, there's a, uh, we're going to have to have a guy go find a link to the plan for restoration of constitutional government. And you'll see that my being older than anybody, I guess, according to Cal, um, that you know some of the tactics they used back then could be effective now because the end result, even though the diversity of the people trying to end the war in Vietnam was uh, unbelievable, we had veterans like myself, uh, the um uh, V V V A W Vietnam Veterans Against W uh, Against War. Uh, Gainesville Seven was a group of those that were set up by the government. Uh, 
so we had very conservative people uh, that were against the war, and at the same time we had people on the extreme left, communists, socialists. Uh, Symphony's Liberation Army, which I mentioned earlier, uh, wasn't uh, as much an anti-war group. They were just anti-white group, I think, more than anything, even though there were some white members of it. But the commitment was great, and there were acts of violence, and there was fear of acts of violence, and that put fear in the government. But then there were also massive peaceful demonstrations. The moratorium in Washington in 1969, over half a million people went there. Uh, I and my wife at the time were two of those people. A lot of our friends, uh, eight of us, went from Pittsburgh to D.C. for the moratorium. Um, and there was head bashing there, Santa Cruz, California. Everywhere I went, people, there was blood. Uh, the, this thing in Pennsylvania with the uh, uh, the G, G whatever it was conference, that wasn't anything like all the daily demonstrations or weekly demonstrations back then. The commitment was higher, and I think it eventually uh, created a, a high degree of concern for the government. Uh, could that activity, <laughs> well, <laughs> let's look at popping cops. Suppose cops start dying of lead poisoning. Now, how many guys that want to go home to their wife and have a good retirement? Most cops make over $100,000 a year. Um, they want a you know, comfortable life. Officer safety is their primary concern. If officer safety is com compromised, are these guys going to say, well, I've put enough in the bank, I think I'm going to find a safer job. Is it going to put fear in them? Can we put fear in the government? Can we put fear in the press? Um, what was that book? Uh, Unintended Consequences, I think is the name of it. Uh, don't remember who wrote it, but it was about uh, Second Amendment group uh, getting rid of BTF, BATF agents. And then there was that... Uh, John Ross. John Ross, right. And then there was that uh, more recent one, Matt uh, Bracken wrote about uh, uh, lying press people getting sudden cases of lead poisoning uh, and all of a sudden beginning to be truthful in their news reports. So, yes, if right now we're the ones that fear the government. If that begins to change, if things start happening, whether underground tactics or any tactics begin occurring that begin to put fear on the other side, whether it be the press or the government, the local government or the federal government, there's going to be a reaction on their side. They don't like it. And I think that was part of the uh, effectiveness of, of what happened in the 60s to end the war in Vietnam. It took a long time, but it finally got the war over with. After the billions of dollars, and wars were cheap back then compared to today, after the billions of dollars spent, the war finally got over. There's no anti-war uh, movement in this country today, but we still got soldiers dying, fighting in a foreign land where there's no justification in my constitution for what we're doing there. Uh, unless and until we take our government back, one way or another, and I think there's only one way, by the way, uh, You know, we just we keep going downhill. Uh, there has not been one year that I can remember where we've made one minor step in a positive direction. All right, and for the one follow up from the same Anon uh, six six one ten, uh, he further asks: No armed robbery for the Weather Underground. I don't know if they did any armed robberies or not. I don't recall. I, I know the people that I met uh, probably would not have. Uh, they, uh, quite frankly, so long ago, I can't cry, quite remember what most of their activity was. There were so many groups, as I said back there. But uh, they were an underground group, and they d did some things, and I just don't recall. Do you remember 6610? Uh, what their activities were other than the uh, their participation in a lot of the open demonstrations. They were in Washington. There was a Weather Underground faction there. The demonstration I went to in San, San Francisco, the Weather Underground was present. So they did these uh, above-ground things. 
uh, as well. But uh, I don't recall what the other activities were. Right, and just to clear up what was mentioned earlier, I believe you were referring to the 2009 G20 Pittsburgh Summit? That's it. Okay, yeah, so uh, just for you, uh, for the listeners listening later on the podcast version, uh, it's the 2009 G20 Pittsburgh Summit. Now, what should you do if you become a victim of police brutality? <laughs> oh, let's go back to uh, Texas Statute 93C1. Uh, that's one option, is to uh, resist that brutality before... Once it's implied, uh, some friends of mine shot a cop. They shot the cop because he started to reach for his gun. George was a little faster. They ended up killing the cop. They, unfortunately, were executed in the gas chamber in Alabama. Um, When the cop draws his gun, it's too late. When the cop started, when he put his hand on his gun, George drew his and started shooting. It's a tough call. Um, you either submit to it. Well, the easiest way to avoid it is to be polite and casual and uh, do the things we've talked about. But if it's going to occur, it's that split second. It's not, I know I'm going to get arrested for a failure to appear. It's, I know they're going to arrest me and take me away, and I don't want this to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. Therefore, I see a threat imposed, and I'm going to respond to that threat. Right. Um, the, uh, the part of the reason I ask this is, I mean, because up on <laughs> to invoke YouTube again, because when it comes to police encounters, this is actually where uh, footage that spread, you know, that that's uploaded by, you know, it's user generated content that's spread around the Internet actually is helpful for once instead of, you know, sensationalistic uh, edited material is when, you know, raw footage is uploaded about of police encounters and um you know, for those of listeners who are listening later on the podcast version, uh, the title of one I'm thinking of particularly is called Cop Punches Victim, U.S. Soldier, for complaining it took them 45 minutes to respond to his call raw. And I believe the link man should uh, get that in the chat room. But again, that's Cop Punches Victim, U.S. Soldier, for complaining it took them 45 minutes to respond to his call. And... Uh, that was uh, that was uploaded uh, February first. So that was last month that happened. This, so this is fairly recently. Uh, just kind of, I don't know. To me, anyway, it has the additional aspect to it as well that they don't even take their that the government doesn't even care for their own uh, civil servants in a manner of speaking, or maybe not so civil servants. Well, let's see. Uh, we'll get all these links posted at the OPF radio page. The URL there is uh, www.outpost-of-freedom.com slash radio, all lowercase letters. And we will uh, the link to this program will have links to all these, this one the Sleepy's talking about right now. Now, when you watch that one, you'll see that that guy did everything wrong. He did get punched by the cop, you know, uh, and cops shouldn't do that. Uh, the cop went overboard, but this guy pissed the cop off. He did everything wrong. He was not casual, and the guy had a gun, and he didn't. And he's lucky he just got punched. Uh, you know, what we've been talking about is avoiding those consequences the best you can, uh, how to stay out of trouble with cops, and that's to be casual, be polite. Um, don't tell him his job. Don't tell him the law. Uh, when you start telling him, uh, you what, you're 40 minutes to get here? Yeah, yeah, it's, he, yeah, he told them, yeah, you guys took like 45 minutes to get here, and I've got this problem with people raiding my apartment or whatever, and then it got worse because a couple minutes in, he, he squares up with him and says, I'm a U.S. soldier and all this, and that's pretty, that's pretty much the moment when the cop hits him and the, uh, the soldier's down on his, uh, or the guy who claims to be a soldier is down on his back. Yeah, and the, the guy pavement. did nothing right until afterwards when he apologized for the way he acted. That's the only thing he did right, but it was way too late then. He'd already been on the ground for a while and everything. So uh, that's that's the that's the picture of what not to do. Right, right. So the earlier uh, video we were referencing was kind of a good ex- uh, example of well, a guy successfully uh, navigating. 
uh, an encounter, and he did get, and he was open carrying, and he did get his pistol back. At least that's what the uh, footage shows, anyway. And uh, then this one with the soldier was pretty much an example of exactly what not to do. <laughs> so I guess so uh, the listeners can have an example of kind of a gauge about uh, both. Now, Anon 2161 from the chat room asks, when told I can go, can I then ignore the follow-up question and start to drive off slowly? I think he's referring to a traffic stop. Yes, you can't. Yes, you can. Once he releases you, um, if he has said you're free to go, the best thing you can do is go right then, start your car and drive away. Uh, if he turns around and says anything, you you might pose it differently. Uh, I believe you said I'm free to go. Uh, thank you, officer, and drive away. But don't say anything more than I'm free to go. Don't go beyond that. Don't get drawn in like Sleepy did <laughs> by demanding your rights. Because cop, cop, cops damn sure won't give you your rights. Right, right. Uh, well, yeah, it's yeah, and it's better to mess up earlier when you're practicing and not when you're actually in the encounter and he's right there, you know, putting his, uh, you know, his uh, palm on the uh, grip and that sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Would it be helpful to carry a laminated card in your wallet that you could hand to the cop that tells him that you are taking the fifth? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, why is that? Uh, I, the obvious. Well, you're telling him your job. I mean, tell it to him yourself. Uh, I have no qualms. You know, I was... I wasn't born with my name. It was given to me shortly after I was born. I was born at a very early age, so I've had it for a long time. Uh, I'm not ashamed of my name, and I'm not willing, to, uh, uh, unwilling to give it to people. Circumstances might change somewhere along the line, and I've got another name picked out in case that ever happens. But uh, uh, at any point, you can say, uh, if this could lead to an arrest or a citation, I prefer to say no more until I have an attorney present. But to hand him a card is not casual. It's belligerent. Assuming the cop can read, and I assume most <laughs> of them have to get the job. But uh, I, I don't think that that really works. Uh, I, I've seen people do it. Uh <sighs> I would rather tell him. I, you know, I have no problem saying, look, if this is going to lead to arrest or citation, uh, if you're investigating the possibility that I committed a crime, I would just prefer to have an attorney present, and I uh, intend to say no more at this point. Now, there is a chance, depending on circumstances, that he could arrest you for, at that point. Uh, if he did, he's probably made a big mistake, and you better have your recorder on. And as long as you've been polite and responsive to... Easily understandable, uh, w w what's your name? <laughs> Things like that. Is this your car? Yes or no, it's my girlfriend's or something like that. Um, directly relative to the fact that you're driving a vehicle on a public road, which that's a whole other issue whether you have a right to or not. Uh, but assuming you're operating under the auspices of the driver's license, those questions should be answered. You have an obligation to. Uh, because you're operating with their license. A license, by definition, is the right to do what would otherwise be illegal, uh, which is why so many people drive without a license. And it's not illegal, but it's illegal to drive without a license if you have a license and are driving without it, which sounds oxymoronic, I guess. Uh, it's like getting arrested for resisting arrest. Um so yes. those questions you really have to answer. But once it gets beyond that point, if you feel uncomfortable uh, and you think he's trying to bait you into something, just say that. It, it, you know, if this, uh, uh, I would rather not go on with this questioning uh, unless I have an attorney present. And there's nothing he can do at that point, but that's directed. You just, I would rather not go on. Well, I'm going to ask you questions anyway. Well, I'm not going to answer them unless my attorney's here. Uh, I've explained that to you, and uh, I think that's my right. I think that's my right. That, don't say that is my right, because that 
turns that one phrase into belligerence, and you might push in the wrong way. Or you could ask him, isn't it my right to have an attorney present? Uh, put it on him to, to affirm that you have the right, that right. But don't tell him the law. Uh, I think it is, or ask him, something like that. Always don't tell him his job. He knows his job. Not very well. Well, show him that. well, the reason I ask that is that, you know, obviously it's been recommended to me from before, and obviously there's at least that one website uh, that's been linked in the chat room that uh, promotes that kind of thing. But it almost strike, and even though it may sound initially like a good idea, what kind of struck me as odd about it is that it almost reminded me a lot of, um, what was it, those stress cards they now have in boot camp? Or, or if you get, I don't know about that. Oh, well, supposedly the Stress was, was part of our training you know, when I was in, so... <laughs> well, so, well, supposedly when in boot camp now in some sort of branch of the U.S. military, uh, you uh, if someone you know recruit gets too stressed out, they have a stress card and flop it down. That's almost what this kind of equivalent is, almost a little bit like if you get too stressed out during the cop uh, encounter, you take out the laminated card and hand it to them. It's, it's, I don't know. There's just something a little off about it, but no, who knows? I, I maybe think that's there just is me. too. You know, the way they dealt with stress when I was in is, is the other way. You force them out of stress. You don't uh, uh, appease the stress. If you, you know, if, uh, if a guy brought the stress back into the barracks, he might get a GI shower, which is a scrub brush, brush shower, by the way. And the scrub brushes are nasty. Mighty harsh, I would assume. Everybody okay. comes out red with the GI <laughs> shower. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, Eli from the chat room asks, the rise of the police state cannot be an accident, right? I think that every government, you know, I've studied uh, English history from 400 AD on, and power always seeks more power and never gives it up until force becomes the 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 casual uh, action that uh, forces the relinquishment of that power. There have been a, many revolutions in England. Some are much worse than others, uh, to the point of beheading kings. Um, it's an evolution. When you give somebody power, well, there's an old saying, uh, you give them an inch and they take a mile, and that's basically it that's uh we've all heard the phrase and there have been benevolent dictators but you could probably count those in history on both your hands um people get power look at the belligerence of these uh people they call a town hall meeting to get the input from the citizens and say you can't ask that question here this is my town hall meeting Things like that. That doesn't cut it. Those people, they're like the royal court. Uh, John Adams had to pay his way to Washington to be president. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's wife had to feed the family and try and save money out of the budget. Uh, Harry Truman uh, went into debt as president because he didn't have the extravagance now. Rand Paul turned six hundred thousand dollars back to the government from his uh, his office allowance. Uh, Nancy Pelosi spends millions of dollars flying around in military a aircraft. This idea of seeking power for the sake of power has become inherent in our politics in, in this country today. And these people keep voting themselves more power. 27th Amendment, first proposed in, um, as, as part of the original Bill of Rights, uh, that no congressional pay raises until the next session of Congress, if they're approved. Immediate, there's an article on my blog uh, about the, the 27th Amendment. Uh, immediately before they knew it was going to be ratified, how they knew it was going to be ratified without... Uh, is beyond me, but they knew it was going to be ratified, and that brings another suspicion, but we won't go into that here. But they passed a law giving themselves a raise every year unless they vote the law down. So now they're not violating the amendment, but they are violating the intent of the amendment. And they've got, you know, some of them have you know millions of dollars a year in allowances to run their office, and so they hire their buddies or their wives or their children 
and uh, that's how they get so so rich. I mean, they they administer a lot more money than their salary of two hundred and something thousand dollars. They have become the royal court that Louis the Fourteenth had around him, that the kings of England have around him. They pay people to sit there and pamper them. Uh, they're on the dole, and these people are on the dole. They're welfare recipients. They're getting money for doing nothing. And the Constitution only provides compensation for services. It doesn't give them all these benefits. What was it, $250,000 or $250, $250, pizza the Obama family had? It was it, it was a, it was atrocious, and I think it, it was just the one event, not not counting the other types of similar events like that, where they just it's obscene spending. I mean, I cannot recall any history books I've read where oh, <laughs> the European monarchs of old would be that lavish. I mean, it's absolutely obscene. It is. And Nancy Pelosi, I think, in one that I read, uh, it was an accounting by the U.S. Air Force of what one of her flats, uh, her jaunts cost, and she ordered 86 bottles of liquor to go on the sense. plane. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how many people were going. But <laughs> let's see, if you had uh, 320 people, that would be a, a quarter of a bottle apiece. They must, <laughs> shit, they didn't need the plane to fly. And I'll look into that weather underground and refresh my memory, but, uh, uh, yeah, they were pretty well recognized at the time. Uh, but, yeah, the government, uh, they tend to seek more power as they go, and, and history has demonstrated that it's only removed by force. Uh, never, well, the Magna Carta was at the point of a sword. And it was actually signed by three different kings, agreed to by three different kings. Because the first one that signed it, after a while, he said, screw it, I'm not going to go by it. And then he got replaced, and then the next guy signed it under uh, duress, not as a point of a sword. And finally, the third one signed it. And it find a, kind of established itself in, uh, in history, but a lot of aspects of the Magna Carta have been set aside even in England at this point. So... Power seeks more power. It's it's nearly automatic. It takes a uh, very principled person to, and we've had some as presidents in this country, but that's been a long time since we've had any of those. And Lincoln was not one of them, by the way. Uh, nor was FDR, come to think of it. Uh, but we've had some pretty principled uh, presidents here, but that's all part of the past, and they tended to be of that generation of the founders or the next generation. Uh, that uh, we're looking at making a a, 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 a perfect country. There was a, a term used commonly back then, uh, the concept of republicanism. And that was kind of an equaling thing. And France adopted the same thing, but before France, the, uh, and they abused it. But before that, the, the idea was, and this is where John Adams was kind of an oddball in this whole thing. He thought the president should be called uh, your highness or some royal title and should be lavished and everything. He wasn't lavished, and he didn't seek it once he got in, uh, but he liked the, the whole concept of the European court. But the idea of republicanism that was true even with the Federalists is uh, we're just people going to work for the government uh, for the purpose of making the government better, and we're not trying to get rich at this. Uh, we're not trying to wield power. We're just looking at the principles we believe, Federalist or Anti-Federalist, which would be best for the uh, uh, the purpose of creating this great country we're trying to uh, uh, establish here. So that, that concept of republicanism was from the, the, the poor people to the, the masters in government uh, was pretty strong. It was just a matter of should it be primarily in the federal or primarily in the state level, and that's where Jefferson and Hamilton were at odds with each other, and they're, 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 those two factions were at odds with each other where we were going. But that concept of republicanism was demonstrated in a, uh, in, to some degree by Rand Paul when he returned that money. 
You don't take it just because it's there. Back to the uh, time off with pay because you killed somebody when you're a cop. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, <laughs> and on a perfect note, should social ostracism of police officers be encouraged? Well, I wouldn't invite one to my party. Uh, uh, it depends on the circumstances. If you're walking down the street and see a cop walking toward you, they don't walk anymore, do they? Oh. If you go in a restaurant and sit down, and a cop comes in and sits in the booth next to you, and you look at him, glare at him, and get up and walk and sit in another booth, he might get your license numbers and call you in. You're, anytime you try and ostracize somebody, you're kind of getting in his face, and it depends on his nature whether he's going to react to that in an undesirable manner or not. So I, I wouldn't really suggest it. I, you know, the risk is there, uh, whether it's casual, uh, whether I don't invite him to a party, you know, he's the only one in the neighborhood not invited to the party. He'll get the picture, but it really can't do anything, but he might, you know, he might stake out your house and try and get you, you know, look at the date on your tags and make sure that you don't go a day over. There's always risk because if he recognizes it, he might try and reciprocate. Right, right. Or as a, uh, or as a friend of the family, uh, uh, of mine told me many years back, you know, anything you, you know, or actually, excuse me, excuse me, one thing at a time. He told me that cops are always on duty, even when they're off duty. So <laughs> assuming he's correct, then what that would mean is kind of go back to your, you know, the, you know kind of go back to your Miranda rights. Anything you say, anything you say, can and will be used against you in a court of, you know, government law or whatever. So if that's the case, that they really are on duty all the time, even when they're off duty, holy smokes, why would you invite them to a party or even certain types of meetings, if, uh, if you understand what I'm saying? Uh, it's, uh, I, I've, seen, I've actually seen it happen once in my lifetime, where there were good people who were trying to do something good and... All of a sudden, the guy just mentions when everyone went around the room introducing themselves, and, you know, yeah, I'm a patriot, but I'm also an active duty SWAT officer. And I was kind of looking around at everybody, and it was like, wow, did nobody do a double take on that? And then some of the other guys foolishly talked about their firearms. Nothing violating Mala Prohibita at that time when I was there, but holy smokes. I mean, <laughs> he just announced himself, and they didn't bat an eyelash. Who knows? Maybe they thought he was a... Oathkeeper or something. Well, if he wants a promotion and he gathers some information there, he's working his way up the ladder. That's like, you know, the uh, years ago, the, the police department's had quotas. Uh, so many tickets. This is uh, revenue, uh, revenue excise activity. A revenue excise officers is, is a state citizen term, a common term back in the 80s and 90s for cops. Uh, they raise revenue for the the community. Uh, so giving citations was rewarded, and I think the Supreme Court stepped in and said, no, you cannot have quotas for tickets. You cannot require them to give 40 tickets uh, a week or something like that. But So they can't pu publicize it. But any cop knows that uh, if he gives more tickets, he's more likely to get the promotion that the guy gives less tickets because he's bringing in more revenue for the, the community. Um, by the same token, if he gathers information at a gathering with you, no, a casual conversation, and reports that, he's getting favor. So there's an incentive for him to do it. And he's not feeling like he's turning you over to, to be shot at dawn. He's just doing his job, like they right. did in Germany. Right, right. And um, so even when I was young, I mean, and I think it's a kind of a good lesson, is that if for some reason, you know, if you're not comfortable or practice yet with, with, talk, with uh, you know, talking during an encounter, you know, if in doubt, shut up and be quiet, at least momentarily. 
and I guess some adages. There are there are actually three adages or sayings to kind of reinforce this idea. Uh, the first one is, only fish who open their mouths get caught. Then, of course, there's the movie saying, you know, the first rule of Fight Club is that you do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is that you do not talk about Fight Club. And then, of course, there's my personal favorite. If you press your lips tightly t- uh, together tightly enough, the silly words won't fall, fall out. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I mean, too many people make too many statements when they're talking to police officers. And, and unfortunately, you know, I think all of us at one time or another may have said maybe something. And even if that, it's usually better to keep it vague, at least from my experience and observations. But, uh, yeah, yeah, only answer what you have to, the, you know, the way it was put back in. I think Roger uh, Richard McDonald told me this. Two rules about talking to cops. First, don't talk to cops. If you, as number two, if you want to talk to cops, read rule number one again. Uh, but then Richard would talk to cops, and I was with him when he got stopped a couple times. But, you know, it's interesting. He had driven without a license in, uh, where he lived in California so much that they'd stop just to talk to him. Uh, they got tired of losing in court, so they don't, didn't give them tickets anymore. And it's driving without a license. If you establish yourself somewhere, they'll stop bothering you. Uh, but uh, f- from a general standpoint, that rule is true. Uh, you have to be extremely careful if you're going to talk to co- cops, and you should talk about nothing except the matter at hand. And that matter at hand, if it's an investigation... You should talk about nothing. Um, They say it's illegal to lie to a cop, but I'm not sworn, so I don't see that I have an obligation to. There's a federal statute. Martha, uh, what's her name, Got went to prison for lying to, what, IRS or somebody? And I don't see how that can be because Congress lies to us, but I have this, this firm belief that I have no obligation to tell the truth to government. It's not in my constitution. Yeah, and and you know, just from my life, I've I've noticed uh, and experienced firsthand just very, I guess you could say, a violation of privacy, even if not legally speaking. Where it's you know, the officer will ask something along the lines of you know, well, where are you going, and what's your business, and where are you coming from, and you know, isn't this a nice day, and where do you live, and how long you've lived here? I, I, you know, I'm just pretty appalled, but. And the temptation for, you know, some of us who have, you know, who still have, you know, red blood pumping in our veins is, of course, to get snarky. And, of course, that's the time to not get snarky, like like you mentioned earlier. But, oh, my gosh, I've just uh, come across that and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, seen it also happen with other people. It's just, holy cow, look at the 20 questions. I guess the only thing you, <laughs> that you didn't ask is, uh, what's your favorite uh, copulation position, frankly? <laughs> Well, you know, the, that preacher or parson, whoever he is, that did that YouTube video, uh, I guess he runs around the southwest challenging the agricultural inspection stations and the border patrol uh, stops and all that. Now, I did get a kick out of one of them, though, and he only did it the one time, but the guy says, are you a U.S. citizen? He said, I don't have to answer that. This is a free country. Uh, can I see some ID? And then he finally he said, are you a, an American citizen? And the cop said, yeah, or the officer said, yes. And he said, can I see your ID? Uh, where are you coming from? Where are you going to? And so he threw the same questions back at the cop. And I got a kick out of that. Not that I'd suggest it. Uh, because if they were law enforcement, not Border Patrol, he would have pissed them off. Now, Border Patrol doesn't have quite the arrest authority that the police have. They have to have suspicion that you're in violation of the immigration laws. Uh, to perform a rest, and I don't think they even do that <laughs> that half the time anymore because the guys are going to get turned out. In fact, some of what I read is some of these guys coming across the border going directly to Border Patrol and asking for the paperwork for the amnesty. But uh, it was kind of cute throwing the same questions back, but if you did that to a cop, you'd piss him off. Uh, you know, he says, can I see your driver's license? Well, can I see your driver's license? That's it. You're, you're done. You're probably going to jail. Uh, there was Martha Stewart we were talking about earlier, and uh, somebody thinks it was the Securities and Exchange Commission that she lied to, and I don't know all the circumstances, but I know she spent some time in prison as a consequence of it. Um, 
And if they assume the authority to arrest you for lying for them, if you're not sworn under oath, which is perjury, uh, but they can uh, put you in prison otherwise. And I don't know if she was sworn in or not. Uh, I don't know what the circumstances are. Um, but uh, if you're concerned, don't lie, just don't talk. You don't have to answer any question unless it's very specific. Yes, my name is this. Yes, it's my car. Here's the registration. Here's the paperwork. That's it. That's all that's required for a traffic stop. Where you're going, where you came from, uh, where you live, those things don't matter. Now, Richard McDonald did have a nice one on, on where you live that he described to me. Uh, he, Like I said earlier, he'd go back by the back bumper of the car and stand there and wait for the cop. And um, if the, guy, the cop said, where do you live, he'd look down at the ground, and then he'd look around, and he'd say, right here. Well, you know, where do I live? Where my body is. <laughs> you know, I can't live there and have my body here. So, uh, And that's not quite belligerent. It's almost humorous. And it, apparently it never pissed the cop off. So you can have cute answers sometimes, and Richard uh, tended to do that. But his nature, his appearance, and everything was uh, was not offensive. But you have to be very careful on what you do. Right, of course. And uh, just for source citation purposes, uh, especially for those guys listening later on the podcast version, uh, if you do a search on YouTube for top DHS checkpoint refusals. That's a uh, compendium of uh, police encounters. The first one's with, I believe it is, Pastor Stephen L. Anderson, uh, as, as well as others who kind of, who success, well, at least some of them anyway, uh, managed to uh, get past those without much well, incident. Let's, let's, let's straighten something else. You said top DHS stops, and then you said police encounters. There's a difference, and I pointed that out. Uh, DHS have specific functions. The FBI is DHS. Uh, all the federal agencies aren't now, that, not all of them, but the ones that carry, most of the ones that carry guns are under DHS. But they're specific. Border Patrol specific. Agricultural Inspection is California, but it's specific. Police are different. They have more latitude in making arrests. They shouldn't have, but they do. So to do it to a Border Patrol agent uh, is one thing. Uh, to do it to a cop is a whole different risk. So if you watch that video, don't think that you will be able to get away with doing what he did to BP That uh, if you did it to a cop. Right. Well, obviously, we've we've gone really through a lot of different aspects of how this all works. So as we begin to wind down for tonight, so Gary, given that the police are not responsible for defending your life, liberty, or property, then what are our options at this juncture? Well, grammatically, that's not correct. How about what is our option? No, there are two: acquiescence or defense of your rights. I kind of touched on it before. When does that time come that you say you're using more force than is necessary and shoot the son of a bitch? Uh, Larkin Rose him. Let's put it that way. Uh, that Larkin Rose uh, link that we put up there, when should you shoot a cop? That's suggested reading let me put it that way and popping cops is too it was an interview i did with john back in the 90s but we either stand up for our, our rights well let me go a little further i spent two years traveling around the country after waco talking to various groups about it and invariably in conversations usually outside of the the, the talks about Waco, but at a Denny's or something somebody said once if there wasn't if it wasn't for Denny's, we couldn't have a patriot community because we wouldn't have a place to meet. But the conversation would all come up, and the, uh, this question would always come up, we're losing our rights, aren't we? And my response has always been the same, only if you're willing to give them up. At what point do you put your foot down and not give up your rights? It may cost your life. But look at how many lives it costs to get to the point that we have those rights protected by our Constitution. Should you value yours any more than those men 
did back in 1775, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 8, 8, 80 and 81? You know, it's a serious question. Someday you may leave the house if you really believe in your rights and may never walk back in that door. That's reality if you believe you have those rights. Why did they give us the right to keep and bear arms? It wasn't for deer hunting. It was for protecting the other rights. So if you've got the right to keep and bear arms, there is obviously the assumption that you may find need to use those arms to protect that right as well as your other rights. That's why it's there. That's the commitment to the country, the founding, uh, uh, that, that we have to the country the founding fathers gave us. And that's the commitment we need to restore that which was given to us at the expense of their blood 230 years ago. So when you finally get serious, realize that you either give them up or defend them. And if you defend them, you will retain your lights, uh, rights, though you may lose your life. If you give them up, How did Adams put it? Let the chains not bear heavily upon you? Oh, um, yeah, if you give me a moment, I, I can pull it up real fast. But yes, it was the idea about uh, let uh, history forget you are our countrymen. While I double-check that, I, and I think it bears repeating, I think you may have answered this right now and earlier, but let's reiterate it. Should you ever physically resist a police officer? If you want to defend your rights, you may find that you have to. But then again, you have to weigh it. Um, when they broke in my door and came in with their guns pointed at me, I had a choice, but I knew I was being arrested for failure to appear. I could bond out and go to court, which I did. Um, George and Linda chose not to submit. Of course, they didn't have guns pointed at them at the beginning of the encounter is when the officer reached for the guns, gun. Mike Hill probably never even touched his gun, and he was shot, which can happen, and that's one of the consequences. Uh, it's a decision that you have to make, and you will have, when you find that the time comes for that decision, you won't have a lot of time for contemplation. So if you want to defend your rights, you need to start getting your mind set upon the fact that you are going to defend your rights. We know it's bad to shoot a cop. We know it's worse to give up our rights without fight. Yeah, think on your feet, I think, is the uh, lesson here, and in addition to other things. And uh, the Samuel Adams quote is thusly, quote, if ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that you were our countrymen. That's it. Are we willing to protect the perhaps the greatest government that's ever existed on this earth? It is no longer, but it can be again. And the plan for restoration of constitutional government, I think, is probably the only conceivable way that it can be achieved. And it's not the open warfare that everybody thinks about, the re second revolution. It's a revolution of sorts, but it's done similar to what the Founding Fathers did, but adapted to the modern playing field, which has changed considerably. Right, of course. Uh, Anon, uh, 66110 again from the chat room asks, it seems too dangerous to try to get out of the car before the cop gets to the window. Is it just an excuse for the cop to shoot you? <laughs> well, cops now don't want you to get out, but 
if you get out in daylight at least, if you get out and have your hands down at your side or out a little bit from your hands and pose no threat, you're safe. He might tell you to get back in because that's what they're training them now. Don't let them out of the car. Now, I've had some cop friends over the years. Uh, not that I would trust them, uh, but they used to, they, there was some cops in Winter Springs, Florida. I had a Jeep Wagoneer. They used to get stuck on the dirt roads. I'd pull them out. We used to smoke pot that they confiscated from uh, the kids in the neighborhood together. Uh, we got along fairly well. I wouldn't trust them very far, but uh, they can be nice guys, too. I was talking to one. He'd gone to the sheriff's department. He was a motor cop, and uh, he was sitting with a radar gun on the side road coming out on Highway 1792, and he was giving everybody a ticket, and uh, he stopped a car, and uh, he had his book out and everything, and I recognized I used to work with the lady, Barbara, that was in the car, and I walked up, and I said, hi, Barbara, and he said, uh, is she a friend of yours? And I said, yeah, we used to work together. We're good friends. And he said, well, I'm just going to give you a warning then. So, uh, but I think I got off point. What was the question again? Pardon me. I'm getting old. Sure. I'll, well, it's it's all it's also been a pretty lengthy one this time, and it's, and it's good with the with the listeners chiming in uh, to repeat Anon six six one ten's question again. It seems too dangerous to try to, or I guess, I guess he meant is it, or I don't know, bad grammar. It seems too dangerous to try to get out of the car before the cop gets to the window. Oh, okay. Now, nowadays, the best thing to do, and I probably should have covered this earlier because they've changed the tactics. They don't want you out of the car, and this is what I learned from a cop. That's where I was going with. It. Um, it was that cop, in fact. Um, when the when you're stopped, roll down the driver's side window, hang your paws out the door. The cop most often will say, "Hey, I appreciate that," and then you then you tell him, "This is what I do." I tell him, "Well, a good friend of mine's a cop, and he said you guys appreciate that, and I don't, you know, I do it for you guys, not for me." And so you've made a friend of the cop already by sticking your paws out because when he can't see your hands he's worried and when he sees your hands hanging out you know put your forearms up on the 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 door and hang your hands out there and he'll like you for it now to follow up on that I, I find uh, that interesting you say that because again to refer to them just for purposes of citation that activist group flex your rights their tutorial videos they said something different they're telling everybody to only lower the window part of the way down, only down enough to uh, to allow the passage of documents back and forth. And the reason that they kind of somewhat admit to, but I'll just say it explicitly here, is so as to reduce the uh, probability of the officer making a claim of uh, either the plain sight rule or probable cause or whatever, uh, that, oh, you know, do I smell marijuana or, you know, cannabis smoke, basically? Well, if you have cannabis smoke in the car, I think your tactic should be different. Uh, also, I will suggest that if you're a female, there are a lot of abusive cops around. Uh, if you're a female, it might be wise to roll it down a little, but I would put my hands up where they could be seen. So, so probably, but what, I, 10 and 2 on the wheel? Ten and two o'clock. I either that or hold them up on the, on the against the window itself. Either one. Just make sure your hands are visible. Okay. And uh, as we are finally closing for tonight, uh, still good though the listener participation though. Don't get me wrong. Our law in our law enforcement officers, the standing army that the founders warned us about. Uh, yes, without a doubt, and uh, our cops constitutional, uh, Roger Roots wrote, and uh, he confirmed uh, even more so on a radio program once when the question was posed to him, but there is no doubt, the standing army was having British soldiers everywhere, controlling your moves, intimidating you on the streets, uh, quartered in your houses, well, they're not quartered now, they just walk in when they want to. Uh, kick the door in if they have to. Yes, all the symptoms. Now, we think standing army is having the United States Army. 
It's not. We've never been without an army. There wasn't a question after the Revolutionary War was over that we weren't going to keep uh, the forts uh, on the coast occupied and the uh, frontier forts where Indian problems still occurred. And then as we moved west, we had the cavalry out uh, protecting the wagon trains and the uh, the communities that were established. So the standing army is not having an army. It's having that army standing in your community. Let me repeat the numbers. There's almost a million cops in this country, law enforcement officers, gun-carrying sworn officers in this country. There's a little over 300 million people, 3.2 people per house, one officer per 100 people. What can I say? This is the standing army. There is no doubt. They're more intimidating than the British were in Boston. And remember, in Boston, when they shot some people, they stood trial for it. When was the last time you heard of uh, a federal agent standing trial? Now, cop standing trial, I subscribe to the FBI newsletter. I'm curious. Uh, and it seems that uh, in the last year, I've collected at least 100 cops convicted, law enforcement officers, sheriffs, local police, or even occasionally, I think, one or two federal law enforcement officers. Uh, but it seems they spend most of their time on busting people for child por pornography and um, Medicare fraud. <laughs> But, you know, they say that the only bad cop is the one they just caught. There's no more bad cops. In the last year, over 100 cops have been convicted on federal, of federal crimes in this country. And so these, those are the ones that got caught. Um, these guys are incompetent. They're brutes. They have guns. They have a dick in a holster on their side. And the women cops have a dick on the in the holster on their side. They're arrogant, they're bullies, with few exceptions. And I grant you there's exceptions, but I wouldn't trust the exceptions. This is, if, if the Founding Fathers saw what we have in this country today, even Hamilton would be appalled and say, you've allowed a standing army in violation of the Constitution. I wow. have no doubt. Oh, man, well, I mean, what comes to mind when you mention about uh, you know the the redcoats not or do, getting tried? I'm kind of kind of reminds me a little bit of the ball, of the aftermath of what was what has been come now to be known as the Boston Massacre. Is of course in our time period there were the uh, <laughs> the cop induced shooting deaths of both Oscar Grant and Jose Guinera. Where they break the door down and come in and, and, where, and, and see where, anybody yeah. can get a cop uniform, one that's suitable, looks like it. Go down to a uh, Army Navy store, buy the gear. If it's camo, just get some black latex uh, spray paint and paint it black. Uh, get some stencils, put sheriff on it. You know, it's crazy that uh, they know that they're cops and you don't know that they're cops. You have no way of knowing. And if you watched the footage on a bust, oh, there was another bust and they never, maybe it was, was the Guerna bust, bust uh, film from the outside, is that the one where they never did say uh, cops warrant? It, they got the wrong house, and Guerner was the Marine, and he was kind of... I know where Guerner was, but there was some footage shot of one bust, and they never announced themselves like they claimed they did. Cops never lie. But the video footage, they never announced themselves properly. They did it like they did it at my office. They kicked the door in, period. Yeah. And, well, even... Well, and, and even if it's not, you know, coming to your home, whether it's in the case of Guerna or that other individual who had his dogs, they actually, uh, there was another individual, uh, the cops came in and killed his dogs, and the dogs are bleeding on the carpet and the rest of it, and the uh, claim of uh, why they were there in the first place was uh, because supposedly he had half a marijuana cigarette. 
And or, that was where the one of the children had to sit there right by their dead dog, right? Their pet dog. I think yeah. that's the right one. I don't remember the name of the man who was arrested, but yeah, that one. Um, and then, of course, Oscar Grant. He was the uh, individual who was. Let's call it what it is. He was murdered on that train platform, and there's actually footage up on YouTube where uh, there were oh, passengers. Oh, the cop walked up and shot him. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, the kid. You know, the kid was already handcuffed and on and on his stomach. But and there's footage from the uh, passengers on the train. Pl- you know, on the train, a stopped train, looking across the platform, and you, you can see the officer pulling his firearm and basically murdering the kid. Uh, and you can hear the gunshot, and people are completely freaking out, and, and which is understandable. I mean, come on. I mean, you just witnessed somebody being murdered in cold blood like that. I don't think that officer uh, has gotten punished. They claim there was an investigation, but this is just typical. Oscar Grant was just one guy. Well, you look in foreign countries at some footage sometime, and you'll see some cops abuse somebody, not kill them, but abuse them, and you'll see the other people turn on the cops and start beating them. We're afraid to do that. We've been conditioned in this country by uh, television, uh, cops, the TV series. Uh, That was one that did a lot of conditioning in getting us to accept that cops can do anything and get away with it. And then we see programs about EMTs making arrests or calling cops or, you know, the the power of government just permeates uh, these these television programs. yeah, like and any, so we're so conditioned that we don't even look out for our neighbors anymore. Yeah, and especially like any of those Law and Order uh, uh, TV series, like Special Victims Unit or the original one, or any of yeah. these, where yeah, like the cops are always good and all this stuff. And and I, you know what my favorite is uh, personally is when they have a suspect who quote unquote lawyers up, and that's evil and wrong, and it's impeding the investigation. And it's horrible. It's like really just. Wow, wow, really? I mean, so much for uh, due process, so much for anything along those lines. I mean, it's really quite atrocious with the predictive programming elements in there. Kind of like how Randy mentioned on a broadcast of his a while back about if you see in these basically simulated, uh, hypothet- you know, simulated hypothetical scenarios, which is what you know, TV is since it's fictional, is when you know, a SWAT team goes in, in, you know, in a scene and they uh, do a you know, a, a, a bus, basically, an armed raid, really. And they tell everybody, get down, get down, get down. So, obviously, if such things should happen to the viewer in real life later, of course, everybody would get down. They wouldn't think of, say, treating the armed, uh, black-suited goons uh, like you would just like any other robber, I may add. What do they call that? Predictive programming, these televisions? You know, they condition us to accept. Yes, yes. And, and you'll see them violate the law, the, you know, the legal law. Let's say not Miranda guy or something like that. Yeah. But then they'll, in, in the script, they will also rationalize their justification of not giving him his rights, too. So that conditioned us to accept the premise that in certain circumstances is all right for the cops not to be follow the rules. Yeah, and it's it's completely atrocious uh, so many ways. So yeah, another thing that I would suggest you know our uh, our listenership do is if, if you happen to still be watching these cop shows for whatever strange reason, please stop, please stop, and don't give me that excuse of oh I just want to learn. No, even if you were trying to study it, all it tells you is that the cops supposedly can do whatever they want because of some supposed higher purpose of supposedly doing something like catching alleged child molesters or whatever the, uh, you know, the serial killer of the week happens to be. I mean, all this stuff that doesn't actually happen in reality. Most police citizen encounters, correct me if I'm wrong here, Gary, are over mundane, almost paperwork administrative stuff or pitiful things that technically aren't crimes in the sense of mullet and say, and it's just atrocious. Well, they had the same effect on law enforcement that Perry Mason had on the legal community. Perry Mason always won his cases, and he was very astute, and he always caught everything. Uh, I don't know how many of the listeners have uh, actually watched the courtroom proceeding. I, I, I'm not talking about O.J. or these all these ones where you get the exciting blurbs. Uh, you know, out of a six-week trial, you might get uh, four or five hours of... Uh, 
Kodak, Kodak moments. Uh, but these things are mundane, and there's nothing exciting in them uh, like you perceive. But the legal community is perceived now because of Perry Mason as they're these very astute people that always catch uh, the the little nuances and and, and finally get the bad the bad guy get, goes to prison. Uh, it, it ain't true. Go <laughs> sit through a whole trial sometime. And see how mundane they are. And see how difficult it is for the jury sometimes because there is no real hard evidence. Uh, it, that, that ain't the picture. But law enforcement, we've got the same thing, that these programs have got us believing that the cops never lie. They never do wrong. If they do wrong, they had a damn good reason for it. It was to protect our safety. Not our Constitution, but our safety. But they're not supposed to protect us. They're supposed to uphold and defend the Constitution. So we got a little uh, discrepancy, disparity there. But if they don't have to protect us from whomever, we have to protect ourselves. Now, if we have to protect ourselves, a perceived threat is sufficient to justify that protection. Back to John Bad Elk and back to Texas statutes. That you have a right, regardless of whether the courts will recognize it, to protect yourself. And if you don't exercise that right, you don't know what the consequences will be. Right, and and that also reminds me, just to reiterate one other key point before we close out for tonight, is, uh, I mean, even Jim Hogshire in his book, You Are Going to Prison, said uh, one of the three key things that people can do to stay out of prison is just understand that most police work, he said 90%, but most police work is basically based on confessions or otherwise informants doing stuff or whatever. Basically, the point is, Otherwise innocent men saying foolish things. So don't go admitting stuff. Don't go blabbing. And certainly, certainly, absolutely do not snitch. There's well, absolutely look, no reason to do that. That that requires a little more extension on it. Uh, when you say confessions, quite often those confessions are for, for crimes that weren't committed. But when you're facing the expense of defending yourself against a crime you didn't commit, and you're facing, say, 30 years in prison, but they'll let you plea bargain and settle for five. And when you look at the impact it's going to have on your family, a lot of those confessions come strictly from an economic standpoint in the security and the protection of your own family. There's a lot of people in prison that have pled out. And this guy... Uh, Recently, everybody was upset when he uh, committed suicide, something related to computers, I think. But he was facing uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines and prison time and everything. And so he took his own life to uh, keep his family from having to, to live the ordeal. He knew he could not win against the government. And you cannot win against the government probably 95% of the time. Well, it's, it's a tough situation when it comes to how to talk to a cop. Well, Gary, I'd uh, like to thank you very much for coming on tonight and really kind of dis going broad but also very deep into how to deal with uh, police encounters. So thank you very much for uh, telling us both what, to, what, what you would suggest to do as well as maybe even equally important what not to do. Well, you're welcome. All right, everyone, that is going to conclude this episode of OPF Radio. Please consider joining us two weeks from today for our next broadcast on April 1st, where we ask the question, I don't bank. Can you do it too? Be free, stay free, and laissez-faire.
I had a dream the other night that, well, I didn't understand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat, and speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hoped you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun. Permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press. And you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You've taken Satan's number. You've traded in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors so their children will be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores and send your sons to slaughter fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you'll fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear and be a slave? Oh, sons of the Republic, arise. Take a stand. Defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Preserve our great Republic and each God-given right. And pray to God to keep the torch of freedom burning bright. As I awoke, he'd vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. We are not free, but we have ourselves to blame. For even now, as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside in a dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he'd fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this... Still the land of the free and home of the brave. God bless you and God bless this room.